Okay, thank you. Um, good morning and welcome to the 29th meeting of Session 6 of the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee. With no apologies this morning. We're joined today by the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Housing and Local Government, Shona Robison, MSP and Scottish Government officials. We're also joined by a number of MSPs who have lodged amendments at Stage 2 and others may join us throughout the meeting. We also have a full public gallery. I would like to welcome everyone who's participating in the meeting today and to those who are observing either here in person or online. We have a large number of amendments to consider and dispose of for this bill. The committee have, has scheduled two days to do this and I intend to allow as much debate as is needed for each amendment. However, I would ask members to be as concise as possible and keep, points, um, to keep their points to what the amendments are about. Um, if we do not make sufficient progress, the committee may require a third day, and should this be the case, I will discuss that with members, and if necessary, we will approach the Parliamentary Bureau to request that the Stage 2 deadline be extended. We are also um, expecting a long session this morning, so I will pause proceedings to allow for comfort breaks at appropriate points. So our sole agenda item today is Stage 2 consideration of the Gender Recognition Reform Scotland Bill. Members should have a copy of the marshalled list and groupings. If votes are required today, I will call for members to vote yes first and then for, for members to vote no and then any abstentions. Members should do so by raising their hand and clerks will collate the vote and pass them to me to read out and confirm the results. Can I remind Cabinet Secretary's officials that they cannot speak during this stage but are um, allowed to communicate with the Cabinet Secretary directly? Members with amendments in a group will be called in turn. If any other member wishes to speak, please indicate and I will make every effort to accommodate. So, we will make a start. Um, so, there are no amendments to Section 1. So, the first question is that Section 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. I call Amendment 18 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. I draw members' attention to the procedural information relating to this group as set out in the groupings. Point out that if Amendment 42 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 19 due to preemption. So, Rachel Hamilton to move Amendment 18 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. The bill as drafted will extend the ability to obtain legal gender recognition to 16 and 17 year olds. My amendments seek to retain the current minimum age required to apply for a GLC at 18 based on a statutory declaration without any form of medical oversight. My concerns and the concerns of my colleagues relate to lowering the age. Uh, below 18 in Scotland. I recognise that 16 is the age of legal capacity in Scotland, but also conversely that higher age limits apply for several matters that are of less significance than changing legal sex, such as purchasing alcohol, cigarettes, getting a tattoo and driving a car. Recently, the Scottish Government sought to incorporate the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child, otherwise known as the UNCRC, into domestic law, which defines anyone under the age of 18 as a child. And according to Susan Smith from FWS, people do not cognitively mature until 25. Using comparisons in other countries who have taken a more conservative approach to the age limit to apply for a GRC, in Denmark, one must be 18 to legally change gender, whereas in countries such as Belgium and Ar Argentina, parental consent is required for those under the age of 18. Furthermore, the Scottish Government are pursuing an inconsistent approach when defining maturity. Scottish sentencing guidelines refer to the sentencing of those under 25, claiming that they are not cognitively developed and have a lower level of maturity and a greater capacity for change. According to the EHRC, this change increases the likelihood that trans pupils will, with GRCs are present in educational establishments in Scotland. This has implications for the operation of the education provisions of the Equality Act. Its specific ex exceptions to the direct discrimination for education providers would not apply in the same way as they do now, because people under the age of 18 cannot currently obtain a GRC. At present, the law allows schools to take a proportionate approach to balancing the needs of trans pupils with those of other pupils. The changes proposed in the bill may require educational establishments in Scotland to treat trans people with a GRC as having their acquired gender for all purposes, including in a single-sex school, leaving the school potentially open to direct discrimination claims if it sought to balance the needs of trans and other pupils. I would welcome if the Minister could provide clarity on this point as to what the position for single-sex schools would be would be should this bill pass unamended. The Scottish Government have dismissed the findings of Dr Hilary Cass's interim review as not relevant to Scotland, which is contrary to the stance taken by the First Minister to compare NHS England with NHS Scotland when answering questions at First Minister's questions. 
We share the view of stakeholders that it is prudent to wait until the final conclusions and recommendations of the CAST review before moving to make legal gender recognition available to 16 and 17 year olds in Scotland. The Scottish Government, I believe, fails to recognise that providing a route to a change of status in law is a form of social transition and therefore is not a neutral undertaking. The Scottish Government and the majority of the committee appear determined to deny any risk that affirming a young person's self-declared gender identity may encourage them onto a medicalised pathway in a setting where the evidence base is lacking. Given the stakes here, every law we make must be supported by robust analysis. We think there are hard questions about Scotland's gender identity services for young people, especially considering the lack of robust data on clinical outcomes. In the absence of better information about the cohort of 16 and 17 year olds experience gender incongruence, MSPs are being asked to make a very significant decision affecting a vulnerable group, based largely on some young people's strongly and no doubt genuinely expressed desires, and the amplification of those by adults strongly committed in principle to an affirmation-based approach. The basis appears shaky for assuming decisions here will have no spillover effect on NHS services and that any legal risks emerging there can be ignored. It does look unreasonable that MSP should decide that NHS Scotland needs time to consider the final cast review recommendations before lowering the age for a GLC is considered. As the Bayswater Support Group for Parents has put it, our children deserve the same level of care and safeguarding as their English counterparts, and it is incumbent on our lawmakers to consider the needs of vulnerable young people when considering this bill. I urge members of the committee to consider the crystal clear arguments I have presented today and support <coughs> the retention of the current minimum age of 18 required to apply for a GRC. I move Amendment 18 in my name. Thank you. And now, now move online to Carol Mochan to speak to Amendment 117 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Primarily, I am raising Amendment 117 to reflect the numerous expressions of concern I and no doubt many others have received regarding the content of this bill. Whilst I do agree that many people are in, are in favour of the spirit and intent, there are details which have been overlooked regarding the practicalities and protections of getting gender recognition certificate for younger people in particular. Given the government have expressed that it considers the minimum age for applying for legal gender recognition should be reduced to 16, it is my view that should the legislation pass, there must be extra provision in place to support 16 and 17 year olds and they must be able to request this should they make this decision. Many young people will be reaching a time of change in their lives, becoming independent, moving away from home, beginning full-time work or starting university or college courses. For that reason, it would be preferable that a young person seeking to support to obtain a gender recognition certificate had guaranteed access to con confidential quality support. Similarly, many particularly of the youngest in this age group, are very likely to be living at home and may experience difficulty communicating the decision to direct family, leading to a sense of isolation and helplessness. This is well documented within the evidence collected. This can be assisted with free and accessible advice that helps young people to understand the practicalities of the decision and their options for the path ahead. It may give the young person support to talk, work with their family at a stage that is most helpful to them. Where challenges, challenges exist, this support could come in the form of a family liaison officer who could assist with communication. In all cases, there also ought to be well-being support available from a professional and trusted source to protect the mental health and well-being of young people who request such support during this process. I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to set out the Government's position on these points that I have raised in th this 117 amendment in, amendment in her remarks. This support must be universal and confidential if it is to succeed, but I feel it is absolutely necessary um, to help young people during a period of particular need. The amendment would give reassurance to young people and their families that there is balanced universal support available should it be required, and any support would have to be a, would have the young person at its focus. And I move 117 in my name. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Um... Christine Graham to speak to Amendment 38 and other amendments in the group. Uh, I'm not sure whether you want me to move at the beginning. Uh, but no, I'm, no, move later. Well, there, I'm told speak, already. Speak to right. um, I, I, I was actually, I rise to speak, but I'm not rising anyway. Uh, I speak to Amendments 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 46, all in my name. Uh, my amendments are supported by Jackson Carlow. 
The intention of these amendments is to ensure that before, uh, before applying, 16 and 7 year olds have made use of the opportunity to take advice, guidance or support in making the decision, including considering the implications of getting a GRC. And this refers actually to a later amendment, which I'll come to about what the Registrar has published. This is mandatory. The provision is not overly restrictive and requires that they confirm to the Registrar General that they have discussed this either with an adult they know personally, for example, a supportive family member or friend of the family, or with someone who has a role that involves giving guidance, advice or support to young people. For example, a teacher, a counsellor, uh, a suitable service such as the doctor, guardian, LGBT youth. There's a whole range. This is for, the form of this confirmation is also not restricted in the amendments to allow for flexibility in individual circumstances. I'm not naming a list. The Cabinet Secretary has already undertaken that 16 and 17 year olds will be offered and encouraged to take up a conversation with National Records of Scotland about the process and effect of a GRC. It is important that wherever possible, the confirmation should be part of such a con conversation which would take place during the reflection period and invite the Cabinet Secretary to confirm whether she agrees with that approach or indeed with my amendment. The offence in the Bill of making a false application does not apply to this uh, confirmation. There is no desire to criminalise 16 and 17 year olds or require them to provide proof. I'm going to say that, if I may then refer to the amendment in Carol Mochlin's name, which tries to do much of the same thing. However, I feel it's, it's, uh, it's rather uh, heavy handed. It's putting in law a necessary support service for application. They all exist just now. And the registrar, uh, must, the registrar General must confirm that the person has actually taken this advice and they make that uh, mandatory, uh, taken it as a mandatory thing and it puts the onus on them because this is a, a big decision for them. These um, advice supports are already there. So I really, if you'll forgive me saying, I don't think it's necessary uh, for your amendment and mine is the better one, but then I would say that. Um, <laughs> In speaking to 4243, the intention of these amendments is to extend the minimum period of living in the acquired gender for application of three months to six months. And I do understand Rachel Hamilton's concerns, and that's why I'm putting in these other precautions for that particular age range, specifically for 16 and 7 year old applicants. But that's the very least of it. They might take longer, and so might 80 year olds. They do this by either, either by introducing two options into the required statute declaration. Either an, application, an applicant must state that they are 18 or over and have lived in their required gender for at least three months, or that they are 16 or 17 and have lived in the required gender for at least, at least six months. This will provide additional assurance that these applicants have had time to fully understand the change they are making and to be confident that they really do want to live the rest of their life in their acquired gender. This will not introduce an additional delay for someone who's already been living in the required agenda for at least six months. They could still apply on their 16th birthday because they'll have done it well ahead of being 16 and after the three-month reflection period could obtain a GRC. Never let's forget there's a reflection period thereafter. Um, I think I make a passing reference to the amendments to... Well, Martin Whitfield and uh, in 120, 124, 120, I think, is just a consequential. My other ones are consequentials. We're not in collusion, by the way, just sitting next to each other by mistake. Um, I think my amendments, again, if I can be modest, would be better. I say put the onus on the young person to specifically confirm they've discussed their application and understand that. It's a, it's a big decision for them, so it's making them sure that the onus is on them to have done this. And I believe that is a better approach than Martin Whitfield's amendments, which puts this on the Registrar General to satisfy himself the applicant has capacity to understand. Capacity is a difficult word in law. Um, I don't know whether it means legal capacity, what kind of capacity. Um, we, uh, there is a discussion with the Registrar that will take place. It can take place face to face or online or whatever. And that's the time when the, the, the registrar can decide whether or not this person really understands what they're doing. Um, I think the word capacity is a difficult word to use in law. Perhaps he should have put in, have, understand, fully understand what they are proceeding to do. But he didn't put that in. That's why I don't like his amendment. OK. Thank you. And Karen I, think Adam... I think I've spoken to all, haven't I? Yes. 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 Karen <laughs> There's Adam. so many. Thank you, convener. Um, uh, I thank Christine Graham for her uh, amendments uh, and you know you, 
you were talking there at the beginning how you have support from Jackson Carlaw. So I was just wondering, in terms of your amendments, um, what kind of support have you had for these in, in conversations with other colleagues? Strangely enough, I don't know. I haven't gone around lobbying for them. Uh, I mean, I, I think um, they're all intelligent people in this parliament, hopefully, and they can see the amendments and see... And I laid the ground during stage one and what I was intended to do is to put precautions and support for the 16 and 7 year olds because I did share concerns that they were being put in the same boat as the 18-year-olds. So I, I'm really the test is on this committee. Um, you've been doing this in depth, so I'm hopeful that this has uh, hit fertile ground. OK, thank you. And Martin Whitfield to speak to Amendment 120 and other amendments in the group. I'm very grateful, convener, and it is always a pleasure to follow Christine Graham, even when she uh, seeks to perhaps insult uh, my poor amendment. I intend to speak to um, 124 and 120. 120 is a, a technical amendment for it to fit in. Um, if I deal first with the purposes behind this amendment, um, the Registrar General will have an important role, or the Registrar will have an important role in this process if it moves forward. And the purpose behind these amendments is really to draw out, and I would seek um, the view of the Cabinet Secretary on this, that our young people who are 16 and 17 have protections that exist around them anyway, and they are quite substantial. It is a transitional period between childhood and adulthood where um, we seek to allow our young people as much freedom as possible while still providing scaffolding support should things go wrong or should perhaps decisions um, be contrary to the interests of an individual. Um, the reason to answer Christine Graham's why I picked um, in respect of the Registrar General on which to place um, the, really the obligation to ensure um, there is some protection there is because this is someone who already undertakes statutory requirements, undertakes assessments made by people who present themselves throughout a variety of our legislation and I think is well capable of making those decisions. And the protections that are extended in respect of this case are really um, very narrow. The, the, the first two contain, contained in 2BA um, is the effect of obtaining the certificate and the importance of a statutory declaration. Well, anyone who undertakes to um, hear a statutory declaration needs to ensure themselves that the understanding of the significance and importance of that document is made. And the effect of obtaining this certificate is to allow the registrar to ask those questions to satisfy themselves that this person um, is, the, is, um, is fully understanding of the consequences of it. And then section B is the very important one to ensure that the application has not been made under coercion. We echo this in a number of other matters, I think, um, of a marriage situation where there is a requirement on the person registering that to ensure that no coercion has taken place. With regard to the discussion as to capacity, um, it, is a, it carries a um, very strict legal definition. But the capacity is the word that defines that position a young person is in to make such a significant and important decision in respect of these matters. So both amendments, mainly in 124, really seek to remind a registrar of the um, legal obligations that already exist upon a registrar, but also to allow um, them in certain situations to avail themselves of the ability to say no, but on the basis that the availability and, and decision would always be yes. Um, unless I can guide any further anyone, I'm happy to leave it at that. Okay, thank you. And Maggie Chapman. Thanks very much, Joe. I, I want to speak um, uh, generally about the amendments in this group. First thing I want to be clear about is that in Scots law, the age of legal capacity is 16. At this age, young people can get married, join the army, work, vote in Scottish parliamentary and vote in local elections. It's almost as if we trust them to make big life decisions on their own. I don't see why this is any different. Let us also remember that many young people have already socially transitioned, which might include coming out to friends and families without applying for a GRC. Not having a birth certificate that matches their identity could cause issues when applying for jobs, further or higher education, and more importantly, leave them open to a lack of privacy regarding their trans status. 
I am vehemently opposed to the current time periods, both the living in the acquired gender periods and the reflection periods. They are not based on specific evidence and they fall short of international best practice for gender recognition, which has no waiting periods at all. Therefore, making the, the three month living in the acquired gender period even longer for 16 and 17 year olds simply increases the length of time they may have documents that disclose their gender history without providing any clear benefit. It also risks there being more opportunities for those who do not agree with a young person's decision to apply for a GRC to go digging through that young person's online presence for misgendering, use of a different name, and so on. Young people tend to express themselves in a much more gender fluid way than, than others, and the longer time period puts them at greater risk of bad faith actors. I would ask how many tra young trans people the, members, the mem members supporting these amendments have actually spoken to in drafting their amendments. If they had done so, I'm not sure we would be here debating them. So I will be de voting against all of the amendments in this group. Thank you. Pam Duncan Glancy. Uh, thank, thank you, convener, um, and I thank the, the members who have put forward um, the, their amendments this morning. Convener, I'd like to speak to a couple of amendments in this group. In short, I think there are merits in many of the amendments we have before us in this section, and I have some concerns about aspects of some of them too. And so I hope, therefore, that we might work together ahead of stage three to bring some of these back. Carol Mawkins amendment, as she has already highlighted, seeks to address the, the concerns that some people have. It would require the provision of free, confidential and balanced support to be available for 16 and 17 year olds applying for a GRC at their request. For some people, this would be really important. And Carol Mawkins amendment seeks to ensure there is support there for people who need it. This amendment would give 16 and 17 year old applicants the opportunity to access it on their terms. This is a positive way to support young trans people to access their rights and is distinct from other amendments in this group and in particular um, the amendment in, in my colleague Christine Graham's name. And so on that basis, if those amendments were pressed, um, I, would, I would need to abstain. Um, Martin Whitfield's amendment would add coercion of 16 and 17 year olds as a factor to reject an application and that there is a presumption that 16 and 17 year olds do have the capacity to understand the process. All of these elements support capacity and the influence of coercion as my colleague Martin Whitfield has highlighted I believe could be helpful and I think should be considered further at stage three and I would urge the government to continue to work um, with my colleague to do that. Convener, I'm afraid I can't support amendment number 31 in Rachel Hamilton's name because it delays the act and trans people have already waited long enough for reform. Thank you. Thank you. And Fulton McGregor. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, just very briefly, I, I mean, I think it's fair to say that this was a particular area that we, we heard quite a lot about during stage one. Um, and we heard varying views and, uh, and, and therefore I'm not surprised at the number of amendments that have came forward. I think perhaps the views of all the, the two sides of the argument, if you like, have already been expressed quite well summed up by, by um, Rachel Hamilton, perhaps, uh, in one respect, and then Maggie Chapman in another. But I think that um, and we heard during the stage one debate that as we move forward through stage two and stage three, we're wanting to build consensus around this bill. And I think that, therefore, this is an area where um, we should try to do that. And um, we've heard the government say that, and, and, and the Cabinet Secretary has has referred to this particular issue around 16 to 18 year olds has been um, one of the most difficult um, decisions in taking the bill forward. So, based on, on what I've heard today so far, I'm not sure who's who's going to press and who's going to um, take it forward to stage three. But I, I would be inclined at this stage to suggest that Christine Graham's amendments uh, find that balance. And um, based on that, I would be inclined to vote for them at this stage, Camille. Okay. Thank you. And um, Cabinet Secretary. Thanks, Convener. Um, in their uh, Stage 1 report, the majority of the committee agreed that the age of eligibility for applicants should be 16, and the principles of the bill had support from members of all parties and were overwhelmingly supported by Parliament at Stage 1. The committee has heard from young trans people, as have I, that the, they currently feel excluded from the system, particularly at an age where they want consistent documentation before entering higher or further education or starting their first job. Therefore, I cannot support Rachel Hamilton's amendments, which are contrary to the general principles of the bill. I have heard the views of members across the chamber in relation to the need to ensure that young people receive guidance and support in making an application. I am unable to support Amendment 117 in the name of Carol Mawkin. It is unclear to me what the provision of balanced support 
might be in relation to a young person's application for a GRC, nor am I convinced that it's beneficial to mandate in law the establishment of a wide-ranging support service for young people specifically in relation to making an application for a GRC. I consider this approach would be disproportionate given the very small numbers we anticipate would apply in comparison with the general population. Support options already uh, exist and we will ensure that young people are provided with guidance on their application and can access uh, wider support. I note uh, from a number of equality organisations that while understandably and rightly supporting the general spirit of improving support for young people, do not think this provision needs to be in legislation. As such, I'd ask the committee to not support this amendment. I believe the principles of what Carol Morkin is trying to achieve, however, are provided by Christine Graham's amendments in this group. These take a balanced and proportionate approach to this issue and I support them all. These additional safeguards for young people provide the reassurance that MSPs have said they want around lowering the minimum age of application. A minimum age of 16 for, a, for applying for legal gender recognition aligns with the provisions in the Age of Legal Capacity Scotland Act 1991, where under Scots law, a person of or over the age of 16 generally has legal capacity to enter into transactions having legal effect. However, concerns have been raised with me by MSPs about striking the balance between autonomy and protection of young people. I'm grateful to Christine Graham for speaking with me about this matter, and I agree that increasing the minimum period of time for applicants aged 16 and 17 from three months to six months would address concerns that have been raised while not placing a disproportionate barrier on young people seeking to apply. We know that applying for legal gender recognition is often the end of a process whereby people made changes to their gender on official documents and where a young person has already been living in their acquired gender for a minimum of six months, they can affirm this in their statutory declaration so no additional delay would be involved for those young people. Increasing the time of the period of time to six months would also give <coughs> young people greater opportunity to access support, advice or guidance before applying, which they can then confirm to the Registrar General. Amendments 120 and 124 in the name of Martin Whitfield, while uh, po possibly well-intentioned, uh, do put the emphasis, in my opinion, in the wrong place. Christine Graham's amendments place a requirement on the young person seeking to make an application to actively confirm that to the Registrar General, that they can discuss the implications of their application with a suitable third party. And I think that's a reasonable expectation. Martin Whitfield's amendments, however, place the onus on the Registrar General to satisfy himself or herself that the applicant has capacity to understand and is not being coerced. And as he said in his evidence to, to the committee, it's not for the Registrar General to be making such determinations, but my own Amendment 60 does give the Registrar General the power to apply to a sheriff in order to refuse an application on the grounds that the application was fraudulent or that the applicant is incapable of understanding the effects of obtaining a GRC or of uh, validly, validly making the application before issuing the certificate. It is appropriate that such decisions be made by a sheriff on the basis of evidence taken by them rather than on the judgment of the Registrar General. For these reasons, I would ask the committee not to support Martin Whitfield's amendments and to support all those in the name of Christine Graham. Uh, finally, turning to Amendment 31 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, uh, I'll again reiterate my position that there is no connection between the outcome of the CAS review of NHS England services and this bill, which is about the process to obtain legal gender recognition in Scotland. I see no reason why the commencement of the substantive provisions of the bill should be delayed. As the Scottish Government has continued to state, we will closely consider the findings of the CAS review in the context of our work to improve NHS Scotland services. And this is also backed up by the evidence heard by committee members during stage one, uh, and therefore I urge the committee not to support Amendment 31. Just for completeness on uh, Rachel Hampton's uh, uh, comment on education, uh, the bill doesn't modify the education provisions in the Equality Act uh, on the requirements for schools not to discriminate in providing education and offering places in schools. 
Extending the effect of a GRC to 16 and 17 year olds does not change uh, the education provisions in the Equality Act, and the Bill does not modify the effects of a GRC. Uh, protection in the 2010 Act will continue to apply uh, to all children and young people, and the arrangements for recognising their transition will remain the same uh, within schools. Thanks. Thank you. Now, uh, Rachel Ham Hamilton to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 18. Thank you, Convener. Uh, whilst I understand the motive for Carol Mocken's amendment to try to implement a safeguard in the process, we will not support, as we cannot envisage that the NHS services or otherwise will miraculously improve, especially because the Scottish Government's reform to self-identity will open up a wider group of people, therefore putting more pressure on our medical services and other services included in Carol Mocken's amendment. Christine Graham's amendment is creative, but ill thought through. How can we, as elected members to this place, guarantee that young people who are at vulnerable age genuinely receive the support that they need? I'm disappointed that the Scottish Government are attempting to use young people as collateral damage to water down the bill to appease their own SNP rebels. I'm disillusioned by the sceptical approach by the Cabinet Secretary. The CAS review is a key piece of work, and therefore the Cabinet Secretary has not taken heed of the interim review. But I agree that uh, moving forward we should consider uh, what the, the full review says. And living in acquired gender for at least three months is an arbitrary figure, um, just like the three-month figure plucked from nowhere without evidence. Martin Whitfield's amendment is flawed because it presumes that the Register General has the ability to determine capacity, something that was never explored during the evidence suggesting regarding the conversation around statutory declaration. However, on a positive note, I welcome Fulton McGregor and Pam Duncan Glanzies offer to work together in the future. Thank you. And I move, I, I press. Press. Thank you. So the question is, Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No, we are not agreed. Um, so, uh, so therefore the question is, um, so we go to a vote. Um, all members who wish to vote yes, please raise your hands. All members who wish to vote no, please raise your hand. Okay. All, all abstentions? And there's one abstention. So, two members voted yes, four members voted no, and there were one abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed. So, I call Amendment 114 in the name of Russell Finlay, group with amendments as shown in the groupings. Russell Finlay to move Amendment 114 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, uh, Convener. Um, let's start with what should be a statement of the obvious. My opposition to this bill as it stands has nothing to do with the rights of those who identify as transgender. These eight amendments in my name are not directed towards trans people. These amendments are to do with criminals, male criminals, male criminals who use lies, cunning and deception to commit and to get away with serious wrongdoing, male criminals who commit serious crimes, especially acts of sexual violence, male criminals whose victims are almost always women and girls. The overarching purpose of my amendments are to ensure that if this bill is passed, it will contain vital public safeguards. I will address my amendments in numerical order. And given the constraints that have been imposed at stage two, I'm mindful of my limited time and intend to be concise. The eight amendments are grouped under the heading Applicants with Criminal Charges or Convictions. The first, number 114, would prohibit anyone on the Sex Offenders Register from being able to acquire a Gender Recognition Certificate. GRCs on the basis of self-identification should not be available to those who have been convicted of sexual offences of a seriousness requiring their inclusion on the Register. As it stands, the Bill would allow a registered sex offender to change gender and thereby acquire a new birth certificate, and which would hide their true identity. This would make it incredibly easy for predators to erase their pasts. Society would be prohibited from any way of knowing if a legally defined female was actually a male sex offender. Prisons are full of men who exploit whatever mechanism or loophole is available to gain access to women and girls and to commit sexual offences. The GRR bill would be a gift to such predators. It would increase public risk, that risk predominantly being towards women. 
Amendment 118 is a consequential of number 125, while 119 is a consequential to 142. I will come on to 125 and 124 later. Next is Amendment 123, which would require GRC applicants to disclose criminal convictions. I believe it is proper for an applicant's criminal offending history to be taken into consideration, given that the safeguard of a medical diagnosis is not in this bill. However, as things stand, and as I understand it, gaps in the bill mean we do not know how this amendment would work in practice. Specifically, it is not yet known who these proposed disclosures would need to be made to. We therefore need more information from the Government, and I look forward to the Minister's response. However, I hope that she agrees that those deciding on GRCs would benefit from being as fully informed as possible. This Amendment 123 would help to achieve that. Amendment 125 is in some ways an extension of number 123. This would require any GRC applicant to disclose convictions for various crimes, those being sexual offences, violence, domestic abuse and fraud. The same requirement would apply to those who are on the children's barred list, a database of those who are unsuitable to work with children. This amendment would also require all such applicants to provide evidence of gender dysphoria in their GRC application. The Registrar-General for Scotland would not be able to issue a GRC unless the applicant provided authentic evidence. I am aware that some of the measures in 123 and 125 are not in place under current law, but that is because they are not necessary given the other safeguards that currently exist. These include the need for a medical diagnosis when applying for, applying for a GRC and that you must have lived in your acquired gender for two years. It is in the interests of public safety that extra care and scrutiny should be taken in respect of those with such serious convictions and those unfit to work with children. I note that yesterday the Equality and Human Rights Commission highlighted a lack of clarity about the use of the, bill, the, the bill's phrase, quote, living in the acquired gender. The EHRC duly recommend that amendments, including this one, should be considered to improve, again quoting, precision and workability. I turn to Amendment 127. This would stop a GRC application where an applicant is charged with any crimes being prosecuted under solemn proceedings. The bill would allow people to change the bill as stands would allow people to change gender after just three months. We know that most, if not all, solemn cases, that is sheriff and jury trials and high court trials, typically take much longer than three months to proceed. Therefore, an alleged rapist would be able to seek a GRC before coming to trial. In such circumstances, we would achieve the ludicrous situation where a rape victim may have to refer to her male-bodied rapist in the dock as she and her. It is worth noting that the Sexual Offences Scotland Act 20, 2009 states that rape is when someone without consent penetrates another person's vagina, anus or mouth with their penis. On December 15 last year, the Criminal Justice Committee took evidence from Justice Secretary Keith Brown and a Police Scotland Deputy Chief Constable. I asked whether a rape, female rape victim might be required in court to use the pronouns she and her for a male rapist. The answer was unclear. I asked whether the police would inform a, rape, uh, a victim if a rapist changed gender before standing trial. The answer was unclear. I also asked if media reports of Police Scotland already recording the sex of criminals based on their self-declaration were accurate? The answer to that appeared to be yes. Mr Brown told me that he does not control the courts. That may be so, but the courts will be obliged to adhere to this bill. The consequences will surely be that a male rapist with a penis could legally be a she. He added, and I quote, that nothing in the proposed gender recognition reforms should impinge on this area. Uh, convener, I fail to see how that can be. He went on to say that courts, prisons and the police are, and again quote, very cognisant of the rights and safety of individuals. But whose rights prevail? Those of a female rape victim or those of a male who can exploit the ease of acquiring a GRC? This is absurd and I believe most reasonable people would agree. It risks making a mockery of the justice system 
and re-traumatising victims of sexual violence. This amendment, 127, is therefore as obvious as it is vital. My next amendment is 129. This would require the Registrar-General to inform Police Scotland whenever anyone with a criminal record is granted a GRC. This would preclude those whose convictions are spent. I believe it is in the interests of public safety and the police's ability to detect crime for them to be made aware when GRCs are issued to convicted criminals, as they would have no other way of knowing under the terms of the Bill as drafted. This is especially so with certain types of crime, including sexual offences and fraud. Some sex offenders will almost certainly seek a self-declaratory GRC as a means to re-offend by gaining access to single-sex spaces. More generally, and as touched upon earlier in my submission, it is likely that some will attempt to erase their offending history by acquiring a GRC. Uh, convener, I was surprised and concerned to learn that more than 500 registered sex offenders in Scotland have recently been allowed to change their names. I would rather that was not the case that they can do this, but that would require a change in law that can perhaps be discussed another day. But at least the police must be informed when this happens. It would be logical and consistent for them to also be informed when offenders are issued issued a GRC. I now move on to my final amendment number 131. This would allow a sheriff or judge to revoke a GRC of someone who was later convicted of rape or another sex crime. As stated in relation to amendment 127, the legal definition of the act of rape states that it can only be conducted with male genitalia. If a man commits rape or sexual assault, it would be an affront for the law and an insult to victims to continue to categorise him as female. Many of these amendments are common sense. We cannot allow Scotland's criminal justice system to be undermined by ill-conceived legislation which has the most profound of consequences. The effects of this bill will ripple through the police, prosecution, prison and courts. Unchecked, it could harm crime victims, enable criminals and skew crime statistics by rendering the recording of sex to be effectively meaningless. The prime purpose of my amendments are public safety and the preservation of the rights of women and girls who may fall victim to sexual violence. I move 114 and I urge members to give them their support. Okay, thank you. And Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thanks, uh, Convener. I want to be very clear uh, from the start that the real threat to women and girls is predatory and abusive men. Unfortunately, as around the, the globe, we live in a society where men in the home and outside of it are the perpetrators of violence against women and girls, and this must, of course, be tackled. There is no evidence, however, that those men would obtain a GRC in order to abuse women or that this has happened in any other countries with similar processes. I recognise that some people have concerns and fears that are genuinely held and we should seek to address those concerns. But concerns about the behaviour of abusive and predatory men should not mean, of course, that we impinge on the rights of trans people. And while I understand the concerns uh, people have about abusive men, the bill takes the exact same approach as the current system where none of those restrictions apply uh, to people who have committed certain offences. This group of amendments would prevent people who have committed certain offences from applying for or receiving a GRC, would pause applications for people charged with certain offences or would introduce reporting requirements relating to certain convictions. I mean anyone with any criminal convictions at all, no matter what, would need to declare that. Amendment uh, 123 does not exclude spent offences and it is not clear how it could be checked by the Registrar-General. Amendments 125 and 118 would reintroduce the need to show gender dysphoria for some offenders. The Scottish Government considers Amendment 114 is likely to be clearly out with legislative competence as incompatible uh, with uh, Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. A further difficulty is that the ban would depend on when those requirements are imposed. 
In one case, the requirements could be just about to elapse when an application for a GRC is made, and another, the ban on being able to obtain a GRC could last for a considerable number of years. Similarly, amendments 127 and 119 would also be incompatible with Article 8 of ECHR and possibly also Article 14, because they differentiate between persons based on the procedure attaching to the charge for the offence in a way that cannot be justified. It also has the same difficulty as Amendment 114 in relation to the timing when the notification requirements are imposed. The Scottish Government considers that, for similar reasons, Amendment 131 is likely to be out with legislative competence as it is incompatible with Article 8 of ECHR and possibly also Article 14 because it differentiates between persons based on the type of offence committed. Again, no such restrictions are part of the current system under the UK Government, which also must comply with ECHR. To be clear, in setting provisions into this Bill that are incompatible with the European Convention of Human Rights puts implementation of the Bill in jeopardy. It brings the risk of legal challenge before the new process could be put in place, and if successful, that would prevent implementation until the compatibility issues were resolved through primary legislation. Convener, the, the Bill already provides for a person who has an interest in a GRC to apply to the Sheriff to revoke a certificate on the ground that the application was fraudulent. However, we have listened to the concerns some members have raised about the possibility of sex offenders seeking to take advantage of the proposed processes for gender recognition. And while we think the processes for sex offender notification requirements are working well, there is an existing legislative power Scottish ministers have to vary the information provided at notification. I can today inform the committee that the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and Veterans will, before this bill is commenced, introduce regulations to amend the sex offender notification requirements so that those on the register are required to notify the police with details as to whether they have made an application for a gender recognition certificate. This will mean additional information will be available to help identify an individual and inform their subsequent management under the multi-agency public protection arrangements. This adds to the information that those on the register are already required to provide to the police, such as name, address and passport, so that the police are fully informed about information relating to the person's identity. This does not mean there is any implied link between trans people seeking gender recognition and sex offenders, but it will mean that Police Scotland will be informed of an application by someone on the register. This will allow them to take action, either in relation to the application itself, if necessary, or as part of the broader police role in managing the registered sex offender population. The action that Police Scotland could take if they believe an application is fraudulent would be to apply to a sheriff as a person with an interest for revocation of the GRC and or work towards criminal prosecution under the offences in the Bill. Under Scottish Government Amendment 60, the Registrar-General, if informed by Police Scotland, could reject such an application following a successful application to the Sheriff, meaning that the applicant would be denied a GRC. This means that it is possible to prevent someone on the Sex Offenders Register from fraudulently obtaining a GRC. In addition, and I don't want to anticipate discussion of a later group, but we'll also note that Jamie Green's Amendment 133 is relevant to these issues. I'll be supporting the principle of the creation of a new statutory aggravation to an offence in connection with fraudulently obtaining a GRC. Taken together, this is the right proportionate and competent set of measures to put in place in this area. And on the basis of the action and the safeguards I've set out, I would urge the committee not to support any of the amendments in this group. Thank you. Um, Russell Finlay to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 114. Thank you, uh, Convener. Um, a number of uh, points, and I think it's worth just repeating what I uh, opened with and what the Cabinet Secretary acknowledged, which is this is not about trans people, this is about male offenders, uh, sex offenders um, in the main. Um, I welcome the commitment that has been given today to amend the sex offender notification requirements, um, which goes some way towards addressing this, albeit nowhere near enough. Um, I do not agree with uh, many of the Cabinet Secretary's views on this. I think the opening statement that uh, this 
there's no evidence of sex offenders having exploited GRC or being likely to is uh, ill-judged and perhaps even naive. I think it's not just uh, likely but inevitable. Um, and I would be quite keen to know whether uh, the proposed uh, amendment, the, the mechanics of that, when, when this comes into being, the, what was proposed as a way of... Uh, well, as I've said, it will be uh, the Justice Secretary will put that into place before this bill is enacted, so in advance. Mr Finlay. Right, thank you. Well, that's uh, reassuring. Um, yes. Yeah, I thank my, my colleague for taking that intervention. And, um, I, I think he, he, he put forward um, you know, a, a, a strong argument um, for the, the amendments that he, that he was making. And I think regardless of whether, and we, we took evidence uh, during committee, whether regardless we think these are plausible scenarios or not, I think what Russell Finlay uh, has done is outlined that, that they could happen. And I also welcome the Cabinet Secretary's um, response in some of the actions that the government will take through through Keith Brown. But, so what I wanted to ask um, uh, Russell Finlay was if there's any, I don't know how, he, how he's now going to uh, go with his amendments based on what he's heard, but if there's any scope for, for him and the government to um, to discuss it ahead of stage three, so that because at, at this point I feel that his amendments are too uh, raw and we don't know the full implications that the cabinet secretary um, suggested, but some of them might be in a human rights context. So that would yeah. uh, that I, I would say that at that point the uh, committee should should vote against these. But given they has raised some concerns um, and there's a recognition that, that, that perhaps these mm -hmm. that, that some some ground could be reached. Uh, I wonder if he's considered on having further discussions ahead of stage three, as opposed to um, pressing the amendments just now. Thank you. Um, I didn't hear anything really from the Cabinet Secretary suggesting an interest in, in discussing a co common ground. I may have been mistaken. I didn't hear that. Um, I think that the su supposed incompatibility of some of these amendments with um, human rights legislation uh, is debatable uh, and I think it's important that we uh, do move these. Before I do, I'd like to make one final point, which is that um, what's being proposed um, is, would be the equivalent of closing the stable door off after the horse is bolted. What my amendments do are preventative. They are about protecting women and protecting the criminal justice system from abuses in quite a common sense way and therefore I would seek to move these amendments. Okay, amendments are pressed. Um, so the question is that amendment 114 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No, they are not agreed. Um, we now move to a vote. Um, all members who wish to vote yes, please raise your hands. All members who wish to vote no, please raise your hands. All members who wish to abstain. Did you get the way? Okay, so that is um, yes, two and no, five. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Um, call amendment 83 in the name of Ros McCall, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. I draw members' attention to the procedural information relating to this group as set out in the groupings. Point out that if Amendment 32 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 93, 57 or 58 due to a preemption. If 93 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 57, 58, 59, 33 or 34, again due to a preemption. If Amendment 99 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 72, also due to a preemption. Members should also note that Amendment 36 and Amendment 113 are direct alternatives. So, Ros McCall to move Amendment 83 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you. Um, first of all, and to clarify to members of the committee, my amendments are probing ones to ascertain from the Minister her views on the principle of overseas gender certificate recognition. Therefore, I do not intend to push the amendments in my group, but I, I hope the Cabinet Secretary can provide some answers. Um, let me clarify for the committee that these sets of amendments do different things. 
Uh, one would remove the process of overseas gender recognition entirely, essentially meaning that we revert to the status quo position of a person having to obtain a gender recognition certificate through the process outlined in this bill without any bespoke overseas recognition process. That's currently the case across the UK. Now, this Amendment 93 um, would, in effect, sure that somebody moving to, from, moving to Scotland from overseas would not have any more or less rights than anybody residing currently in Scotland, and that is the important part. The intention of the other amendments in this grouping is to allow uh, approved countries, in adverted commas, to have the process of overseas gender recognition while everyone else will have to go the, through the process to obtain a gender recognition certificate. And this was to outline an alternative to the committee rather than removing the overseas agenda recognition provision from the bill in its entirety. However, as previously mentioned, I don't intend to push these amendments at this stage. As this bill is introducing a new process for overseas gender recognition, I think it's important that we get the, on record the Minister's view on the need for this provision and the safeguards that are required if it's to proceed into law. So, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary directly what the Scottish Government's justification is for introducing this new process of overseas rec uh, recognition for gender certificates? Does the uh, Minister agree that the current draft of the Bill does not have adequate safeguards in the terms of preventing um, excuse me, but bad actors um, from exploiting the overseas recognition provision as they currently stand? And is the Minister willing to strengthen the safeguards in this part of the Bill um, as and does she see any merit in the proposed outlines on my amendments that she could support if technical drafting on them would be improved? Thank you. So if I can um, just pause um, just now, um, the last vote on 114, I announced 2-5, and but the correct vote was 3-4. So just to confirm the vote on 114 was 3-4 and 4 against. Okay, thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I don't support the amendments in this group in the name of Rose McCall, but I'm happy to continue to discuss uh, ahead of stage three uh, any uh, further concerns that, that she may have. Um, at present, overseas uh, gender recognition is not recognised automatically in the UK. Persons who have obtained gender recognition overseas who wish to be recognised in the UK have to apply to the gender recognition panel under its overseas track. The overseas track operated by the panel is used when a person has obtained gender recognition in what is called an approved country or territory, listed in a statutory instrument made by the Secretary of State after consulting with the Scottish ministers and the Department of Finance and Personnel in Northern Ireland. Uh, this is a system that uh, Rose uh, McCall, um, I think, wishes to emulate um, despite the fact that the present list of countries and territories maintained by the UK government has not been updated for 10 years. It therefore features ju jurisdictions that have changed and updated their systems for gender recognition in that time, several of which are now based on similar models to that contained in this bill, and equally does not include countries that have introduced gender recognition systems, including our near neighbours, Ireland. Uh, Section 8N1 of the Bill, which would be removed by these amendments, provides that where a person has obtained overseas gender recognition, they are to be treated as if they had been issued with a full GRC by the Registrar General for Scotland. So in broad terms, the Bill's approach is similar to the current approach taken in Scotland to, uh, for the validity of marriages entered into out with Scotland and recognition of divorce obtained overseas. It's a more straightforward and, and less convoluted approach than that uh, proposed by Rose McCall. Automatic recognition would not apply, though, if it would be manifestly contrary to public policy to do so. For, for example, in a case where legal gender recognition was obtained overseas at a significantly younger age. So I therefore urge the committee uh, not to support uh, these amendments. Uh, turning to the amendments in uh, my name, Section 8 of the Bill inserts two new sections, 8M and 8N, 
into the 2004 Act, which provides for automatic recognition in Scotland of a gender recognition certificate issued elsewhere in the United Kingdom and of gender recognition obtained overseas. Amendments 56 and 57 clarify that the automatic recognition ends if the gender recognition obtained elsewhere no longer has effect. Amendment 58 relates to cases where someone with overseas gender recognition of their male or female gender goes on to acquire recognition of a non-binary gender in their own country, for example, Denmark or Malta. Uh, this, the amendment provides that in Scotland their gender will not revert to being their gender at birth, but will continue to the, be the male or female gender they had previously acquired. These amendments are intended to cover specific eventualities in line with the general principles of the Bill and I would urge the committee to support them. OK, um, Ros McCall to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 83. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'd like to um, um, welcome the Cabinet Secretary's remarks. Thank you very much indeed for that. And I will accept the offer to work um, with you to improve the uh, government's amendments at stage three. Um, so therefore, we'll support the amendments uh, in this group. Thank, can I confirm that you want to withdraw? I'm not pressing them. You, I'm going to withdraw. Yeah. You want to withdraw. Um, so the member is seeking permission to withdraw <coughs> Amendment 83. Is that agreeable? OK. Um, I therefore call Amendment 2 in the name of Sue Webber, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Sue Webber to move Amendment 2 and speak to all amendments in the group. Yes. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning. And my, this group of amendments are regarding the retention of the current application process and evidence required in support of applications. So these amendments bring the legislation to the status quo, uh, retaining and importantly retain current safeguards. They would mean that all of the existing provision about the Gender Recognition Certificate, the GRC, in the 2004 Act would be retained. So it would operate in the same way that it does now. The only difference would be that an application can be made to the Registrar General, but the application to the Reg Registrar General would, with these amendments, still need the approval of the Gender Recognition Panel, so the effect would be the same. The aim of keeping the current legislation in place is to protect vulnerable young people from making life-altering decisions, while protecting women and girls from bad faith actors that might take advantage of these changes. Amendment 2 retains the Gender Recognition Panel specifically, as there is not enough evidence supporting the removal of the panel. And even though we recognise and acknowledge the issues some people have had with the panel, we believe that overall the panel provides a system of safeguarding and gatekeeping. We also believe that more evidence should be required before removing it, and currently there is just not enough evidence to suggest that the Register General alone should be responsible for the administration of the Gender Recognition Certificates. Amendment 3. This retains the need for a medical diagnosis. A medical diagnosis of gender dysphoria can distinguish between bad actors. Women's Rights Network Scotland have told us that removing the requirement for a medical diagnosis could lead to an abuse of the system by bad faith actors, particularly predatory men that we've heard from colleagues earlier. My Amendment 4 retains the need for one to have lived for two years in the acquired gender, whilst also maintaining that the applicant be at least 18 years old. We believe that three months is too little time to take such an important decision. Distressed people can take, make lifelong decisions before medical professionals have had the chance to help them, especially when coupled with the lack of a gender dysphoria diagnosis. And we all know a lot can happen in two years, in particular when you're young and growing. The Scottish Government's decision to set a three-month period is entirely arbitrary and lacks evidence. Furthermore, a 16-year-old is too young to obtain a GRC and allowing them to make a life-altering decision after a short period of time could have negative consequences which are just not accounted for in the Bill. The amendments 5 to 17 are all consequential amendments as a result of reverting back to the status quo. They remove sections, and there's a long list, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 and the schedule. This is necessary because of my first three amendments, which remove sections 2, 3 and 4 of the Bill. 
they mean that all these subsequent sections of the bill are no longer required. For example, the sections on further provision about applications and certificates is void when the status quo is retained because these sections are changing the provisions in the bill that I wish to remove. I hope that clarifies the position for the committee. And convener, uh, this is not just my position. A poll has indicated that only a minority of Scots support removing these safeguards. Only 19% of Scots support reducing the age when one can obtain a GRC from 18 to 16. 25% support cutting the waiting period from two years to three months. And 26% support removing the requirement for a medical diagnosis. The current safeguards exist in law are important and I, along with the majority of the Scottish public, recognise this and want them retained. I hope the committee agrees to these amendments. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. And I call Rachel Hamilton to speak to Amendment 26 and other amendments in the group. My amendment, thank you, Convener. My amendment seeks to retain the requirement to provide evidence to accompany an application for a GRC. It would specifically retain sections from the 2004 Act, ensuring that legitimate concerns of parents, young people, and gender identity experts regarding the removal of safeguards are addressed. The GRR bill would remove the requirement for medical evidence and reduce the period that applicants must live in their required gender before applying for a GRC from two years to three months. The Scottish Government want a system for legal gender recognition based on a statutory declaration and not a gender dysphoria diagnosis. I'd like to ask the Cabinet Secretary um, if she can cite evidence from other countries where the impact of reform has been um, evidential from these emerging policies. And can she also comment on the prediction that removing a gender dysphoria diagnosis will not extend GRCs to a much larger and diverse group, such as predatory men? How will vulnerable individuals be supported? without medical support? How will undiagnosed conditions be picked up? What evidence does the Scottish Government have that dropping the requirement to provide medical evidence is best for everyone? Surely that stance point is entirely subjective. Finally, why does anyone without gender dysphoria need to change their sex in law? NHS guidance says social transition should only be considered where the approach is necessary for the alleviation of or prevention of clinically significant distress or significant impairment in social functioning and the young person is able to fully comprehend the implications of affirming a social transition. Doctors caring for youngsters distressed about their gender have been told that this is not a neutral act to help them transition socially by using their preferred new names or pronouns. The draft guidelines say doctors should carefully explore underlying health problems, including mental ill health, amid concerns that the NHS is rushing children onto irreversible puberty blocker medication. A significant proportion of children and young people who are concerned about or distressed by issues of gender incongruence experience coexisting mental health, neurodevelopmental neuro and or family or social complexities in their lives. A number of um, doctors, including Dr Anthony Latham, Chair of the Scottish Council on Human Bioethics, Dr Anne Williams, Vice Chair of the Scottish Council on Human Bioethics, and Dr Callum McKellar, Director of Research at the same institute, said, Unfortunately, the Stage 1 report on the Gender Recognition Reform Scotland Bill, which was published by the Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee of the Scottish Parliament on the 6th of October, has not sufficiently considered the evidence of mental disorders, which are often present with gender dysphoria. As a result, the recommendations given by the majority of MSPs preparing the report are unsafe and should be rejected. In summary, summary, the majority position in the report from the Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee is unworthy of the high expectations of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish people since it is unreasonable, unprofessional and does not sufficiently address the biomedical evidence. Moreover, as the Scottish Parliament does, not, does accept the majority view of the committee in removing the requirement for medical opinion before gender transitioning takes place, this will lead to some young persons being harmed. Moreover, research shows that many children with gender dysphoria have significant psychological and physiosocial vulnerabilities. Thus, without a medical appraisal, it is very unlikely that many young persons may embark on risky life-changing pr procedures which they do not understand. And this is all more concerning since follow-up studies indicate that overall the distress experienced by young people affected by gender dysphoria disappears in about 85% of cases either before or early in puberty, through the rates and studies vary, though the rates and studies vary widely. With regards to living in the acquired gender, three months is too short a time for such a life-changing decision 
especially for 16 and 17 year olds who are going through significant changes such as puberty and exams. Furthermore, living in the acquired gender for just three months without a diagnosis of gender dysphoria may not be enough time for an individual to seek medical help or support with mental health if needed. It appears that many stakeholders are concerned that clarity is required over what living in an acquired gender even means. Two years provides sufficient safeguarding. Thank you. Thank you. And Maggie Chapman. Thank, thanks very much, Joe. It may surprise colleagues that I want to speak in this grouping, but I will be supporting Amendment Number 14. Taken on its own, Amendment 14 removes the specific criminal offence introduced by the Bill of making a false declaration in relation to one's trans status. We heard from several people and organisations in, in evidence sessions, the Children's Commissioner, Amnesty International, Just Right and in Gender, that this specific offence is unnecessary. It already is a criminal offence under the Criminal Law Consolidation Scotland Act 1995 to make a false statutory declaration, and the introduction of a new offence risks unnecessarily criminalising children. But there is another reason not to have this offence. Having a specific offence that names trans people specifically potentially makes an already marginalised and vulnerable group more of a target for litigation. So for very different reasons to Sue Webber and from a very different uh, place of principle and value, I will vote in favour of the removal of Section 14 from the Bill. Thank you. Okay. Um, Fulton McGregor. Uh, thanks, Convener. I just uh, wanted to speak briefly on these amendments, um, followed by Sue Webber and Rachel Hamilton. Um, I mean, as I said in previous um, interventions, um, I think that stage two will allow us to find a lot of compromise and I, I will still take this opportunity for before his preview, before he presses the other amendments later on for Russell Finlay to, to work with the government. But in this particular area, I, I think, you know, this is the core of the bill um, that, that we're talking about here and some of the evidence that we heard in committee um, about needing, um, you know, basically medical permission for people to be who they are is, is really, you know, against the grain of the bill. Um, and uh, I won't get into the whole debates around the, the, the three-month period, because um, I know, convener, that um, time is tight um, and, and that those issues have been debated um, quite thoroughly. But in terms of um, the process for an application, um, I can't agree with these uh, amendments uh, at all. I do think that they go to the core of the bill. And the purpose of this bill is to make life better for trans people. And we've got to keep that at the core. And while I really do want to find compromise as we move forward through this bill, and I know the government do as well, um, I, I cannot support these amendments. OK, thank you. And Pam duncan Glancy. It, thank you, Convener. Similarly to my, my colleague, Fulton McGregor, I would just like to, to, to put on record that, that we will be voting no to the amendments in this section today on the basis that they undermine the purpose and principle of the legislation we are trying to um, discuss today. Uh, we will be voting um, against Amendment 2, 3 to 17 and 26. OK, thank you. And Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thanks, Convener. Uh, the effects of Amendments 2 to 17 in the name of Sue Webber uh, are obviously not in keeping with the general principles of the Bill as agreed to by the majority of this committee and a clear majority of the Parliament at Stage 1, including members of all parties. Amendment 26, in the name of Rachel Hamilton, presumes that Sue Webber's amendments would be passed and it would remove the requirement for medical reports submitted to a gender recognition panel to include details of treatment for the purpose of modifying sexual characteristics which the applicant has undergone, is undergoing or has been prescribed or planned for them. The other requirements uh, relating to medical reports in the 2004 Act uh, would remain. Um, uh, Rachel Hamilton had asked uh, a question about uh, international evidence and just briefly to point out that the committee itself uh, looked at this and I think one of the uh, people giving evidence to the committee was the United Nations independent expert on uh, protection against violence and discrimination uh, based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And they uh, gave evidence that some of the uh, theoretical concerns that were raised in the process of, of adopting those processes have not materialised in the countries, the numerous countries that have 
implemented uh, similar uh, systems. And of course, the committee's report uh, noted that the majority recognised that when asked about evidence of abuse and concerns, that there was no witness was able to provide concrete examples. I'm quoting from the committee's report uh, directly. So I think in, in short, the Parliament has shown their support for the principles and purpose of the bill, which uh, as shown in the, the long title of the bill, aims to reform the grounds and procedure for obtaining gender recognition and for connected purposes. So I would or urge members to vote against these amendments. Thank you. And Sue Webber to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 2. Uh, thank you, convener. And yes, I'd like to make reference to particularly the comments from Fulton McGregor and also the Cabinet Secretary regarding what the comments are about this, these series of amendments being against the principles of the bill. We too want to safeguard and make sure people that are trans people can go through this process in as much streamlined and secure way possible. We do not want to make life more challenging for these people. And I want to make that clear. Um, I think a person can go through a range of life experiences in two years, as I mentioned, schooling, changes to family and moving to different parts of the country, puberty to name but a few. And I think having the safeguards in place will make sure that the right decisions are made. These are life altering decisions that these people can be taking. They are not reversible. And I think that is something we need to look long and hard at. Um, in given the comments that we've had and the feedback from discussions with my colleagues as well, I think today I will look to only press Amendment 2, Convener. And with that, I'll conclude my okay. comments. Thank you. And the question, therefore, is that Amendment 2 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yeah. No. That is not agreed. Um, so all those who... Um, all members who wish to, to vote for, please raise your hands. All those against, please raise. And I think there are no amendments. Extensions. No extensions, sorry. Okay, so that is two for and five against with zero abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call Amendment 84 in the name of Ros McCall, already debated with Amendment 83. Ros McCall to move or not move? Not move. Moved. I call Amendment 85 in the name of Ros McCall, already debated with Amendment 83. Ros McCall to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 115 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, grouped with Amendment 116. Pam Duncan, sorry. Sorry, we'll just take a... That's the beginning of the next group. Yeah, sorry, put my... an issue in my... Yeah. So there's a bit... It's a bit missing, yes. Sorry, 115, is that one would be moved? No. Open to it. Just keep calling in 115. Okay, call in 115 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, group with Amendment 116. Pam Duncan Glancy to move Amendment 115 and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, convener. Yeah. I have brought this amendment because I don't think it's fair to exclude asylum seekers from the process. My amendment explicitly adds them to the bill and I'd encourage members to vote for Amendment 115 in my name for that reason. Thank you. Thank you. And Tess White to speak to Amendment 116 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Um, the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee's Stage 1 report highlighted that there is uncertainty among stakeholders about what ordinarily resident means in practice. Amendment, amendment 116 seeks to clarify from the Scottish Government what it means to be ordinarily resident in Scotland for the purpose of obtaining a gender recognition certificate. It's, it, it's, the intention is to provide clarity, but also a safeguard to prevent the potential for GRC tourism. The explanatory notes for the Gender Recognition Reform Bill states the term ordinarily resident is not defined by the bill and thus takes its normal meaning. That normal meaning 
is determined largely by case law and specifically the Shah test. The policy memorandum for the bill suggests that a person is ordinarily resident in a place if they have lived there on a settled basis, lawfully and voluntarily. But it also states that whether a person is ordinarily resident in Scotland will depend on their individual circumstances. While the Scottish Government has emphasised that the concept is used in 17 Acts of the Scottish Parliament, as well as UK legislation, it's clear the term is not understood more widely. In her evidence to the committee, I note that human rights lawyer Jen Ang with Just Right Scotland, which I understand part, is partly funded by the Scottish Government, emphasised that, and I quote, the term ordinary resident is used differently in different parts of legislation. So when it is included in a piece of legislation, it's really, it is important to define what it means specifically. It is not even to avoid unintended consequences. It is just to make it clear to everyone who is physically in Scotland whether the procedure is available to them. In Ireland, where self-ID has been in place since 2015, ordinary residence is also used to determine eligibility for applying for a GRC. However, the definition of ordinarily resident in Ireland is that you have, you have been living in Ireland for at least a year, or you intend to live here for at least one year. My amendment mirrors that approach, and I would be grateful if the Minister could indicate whether such an approach was considered when the bill was being drafted. I further note that the Student Awards Agency Scotland website states that the Scottish Government expects someone who is ordinarily resident in Scotland to have made their home in Scotland with the intention of staying and living here, and not just to undertake a course of study. I will briefly address Pam Duncan Glancy's Amendment 115, which attempts to clarify the definition of ordinary residence in relation to refugees. I know the committee considered this issue during the evidence it took on the bill and sought further, to, further clarity from the Scottish Government. I am supportive of Pam Duncan Glancy's policy, in, policy intention in this area. I urge the committee to consider defining ordinarily resident on the face of the bill so that it is clear from the outset who is able to apply and to prevent the potential for misuse. And finally, committee, the concept of ordin ordinary residence engages the question of fact and degree as well as intention. The fact that the Scottish Government has chosen not to define ordinary residence on the face of the bill at the outset doesn't prevent it doing so now. I suspect that the government has pursued the approach it, it has on this concept so that a great deal will go into guidance or, or its equivalent, which MSPs are enabled to scrutinise during the parliamentary passage of the bill. As such, I will press Amendment 116. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I call Rachel Hamilton. Uh, Vina, I just want to thank Pam Duncan Glancy and Tess White for their um, very constructive amendments. We are happy to support asylum seekers being introduced into this measure as asylum seekers can be classified ordinarily resident in Scotland. I would also urge members to support my colleague Tess White's amendments, which would strengthen the definition of ordinarily resident to provide clarity for everyone, including asylum seekers. Thank you. And Cabinet Secretary. Thanks, uh, convener. The uh, committee stage one report asked uh, for clarity on the phrase ordinarily resident in Scotland, and we did provide that in a response. For today's purposes, I will therefore reiterate again um, that ordinarily resident is an established uh, concept within several areas of law, um, and uh, as Tess White herself uh, indicated, is used in at least 17 Acts of the Scottish Parliament and many more UK Acts. This includes Section 3C of the 2004 Gender Recognition Act which in relation to Scotland enables certain persons to apply under an alternative track for a GRC if they are in a marriage uh, solemnised in Scotland or a civil partnership registered in Scotland. One of the conditions for such an application is that the applicant is ordinarily resident in Scotland. Uh, Amendment 115 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy seeks to include a person who is seeking asylum 
in Scotland within the definition of ordinarily resident. And let me begin by saying I'm, of course, very sympathetic to the concerns expressed during stage one about the potential that asylum seekers living in Scotland might not meet the requirement of being ordinarily resident. But an asylum seeker does not seek asylum in Scotland, but in the UK through immigration laws that are reserved. As I've just said, ordinarily resident is a, an established concept in law, and it is the case that under the UK <coughs> asylum and immigration system, some asylum seekers may not meet the test of being ordinarily resident. In addition, asylum seeker applicants who are not ordinarily resident in Scotland who, and who have not been uh, born in Scotland have a, a tenuous connection with this jurisdiction, which raises a, a competence issue. There is also case law which has confirmed that a failed asylum seeker is not ordinarily resident because they do not meet the requirement that residence must be lawful. I have highlighted the committee's comments about asylum seekers in correspondence to UK ministers and await their uh, reply. I would also like to say that there is still a, a route open to asylum seekers to gain legal recognition. Whilst they may not meet the residency criteria within our process, they may be able to apply under the 2004 Act, as it would apply in the remainder of the UK, as it does not specify a requirement for ordin ordinary residence within the UK. Therefore, uh, unfortunately, I must ask the committee not to support this amendment for uh, these reasons. Uh, I'll now turn to Amendment 116 in the name of Tess White, which seeks to strictly define the term ordinarily resident in Scotland as being limited to those persons who have been living or intend to live in Scotland for a minimum period of one year. Having an intention uh, to live in Scotland does not satisfy those tests to be ordinarily resident. Uh, Tess White's aim to redefine the term go beyond the criteria established in law against which an individual's circumstances are assessed for whether they are ordinarily resident, namely that their residence is here, uh, here is voluntary uh, for settled purposes and lawful without any necessary period of time having uh, to be established. So for these reasons, I, I urge the committee not to support this amendment. Thank you. And Pam Duncan Glancy to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 115. Uh, I, I thank the convener for that, and I thank the cabinet secretary for her answers. And, and I note concerns around um, some of the competency of this, but I, I believe that we we do need to um, send a signal that asylum seekers are welcome to apply for this process. And I wonder, therefore, if the cabinet secretary would consider that in in Tess White's amendment 116 where the, the requirement is that they intend to be here for longer than a year. I would imagine most asylum seekers would make that declaration and believe it to be true at the time. And on that basis, would the Cabinet Secretary consider supporting that amendment? So I, I think, it, to, in response to Pam Duncan Glancy, the issue is, is less about that and, and the basis of which asylum seekers are, are here uh, in Scotland and the fact that they are here under immigration legislation. Um, what I would be prepared to do um, is to work further with Pam Duncan Glancy to see if there is a way uh, to work through this and uh, perhaps to try and elicit a response from the UK government in advance of stage three to be able to discuss this further to see if there is anything we can do within the competency of this bill if Pam Duncan Glancy was minded not to press at this stage. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, um, and, I, and I appreciate that. Um, I, I, I'm tempted to press at this stage because I want to, to put it on the record the strength of feeling um, for asylum seekers to be included in the bill. But I also would welcome discussions um, further at stage three, um, particularly, uh, particularly if this particular issue isn't um, addressed in um, the committee today. Sorry, was that to, to press? I, yeah, I therefore, sorry, I therefore do press this amendment. Okay, thank you. So the question is that Amendment 115 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, that is not agreed. Um, all those in favour of 115? Okay. And all those, all those against? And abstentions? Okay, so that is uh, four votes for and three votes against. The amendment is therefore agreed to. 
I now call Amendment 116 in the name of Tess White, already debated, with 115. Tess White to move or not move? I move 116, convener. OK. One, one, so the question is that 116 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. No. Um, so uh, we'll go to a vote. All those who wish to vote for, please raise your hand. All those against? That is three, four and four against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Call Amendment 86 in the name of Ros McCall. Already debated with Amendment 83. Ros McCall to move or not move? Will not move. Thank you. Question is Amendment... Sorry, the question is that Section 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. Call Amendment 117 in the name of Carol Mochen. Already debated with Amendment 18. Carol Mochen to move or not move? Uh, not moved. Thank you, Kavina. Not moved. I call Amendment 87 in the name of Maggie Chapman, grouped with Amendments 88, 89, 91 and 141. And I draw members' attention to the procedural information relating to this group as set out in the groupings. Point out that if Amendment 91 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 121 due to a preemption. Maggie Chapman to move Amendment 87 and speak to all amendments in this group. Thanks very much, Joe. I've made no secret of my opposition to any waiting times for the GRC application process. As we have heard repeatedly in evidence, the three-month periods of living in the acquired gender before an application and three months reflection period following an application before it is granted are arbitrary, unnecessary and unusual. I'll start, though, with the last amendment in this group, Amendment 141. As I appreciate, I'm unlikely to attract cross-party support for abolishing both the time periods completely. Amendment 141 calls for a review of the impacts of these time periods on trans people themselves. If we retain the time periods in any form, we do so knowing that we are going against international best practice and against the advice and guidance of trans people and the organisations that directly support them. So we should put in place a clear mechanism for reviewing the impacts of these time periods on trans people themselves specifically. And that is what Amendment 141 does. But on the other amendments in this group, 87, 88, 89 and 91, these come from a position of principle that we should recognise the autonomy of trans people and that they know their own minds. Changing one's legal gender is not something that one does on a whim. Indeed, the discussions we have had and will have about ensuring the gravity of making such a statutory declaration is understood make that even clearer. Changing one's legal gender is not done lightly, and those applying for a GRC will likely have thought about, considered and reflected upon this decision for months, if not years, before they get to the point of putting in an application for a GRC. And they are likely, have, likely to have completed many other aspects of their transition over the course of several months or years before applying for legal gender recognition. Having spoken to young trans people themselves, as Dr Mary Crawford of LGBT Youth Scotland does regularly, she said in a committee evidence session that young people tell us that before they come out, they have already done an awful lot of reflection to understand their true gender. Then they come out, usually to a safe group, and they build up from that. By the time they look to apply for a gender recognition certificate, they have been living in their acquired gender for quite some time. Only Belgium and Denmark have a reflection period in place. We heard evidence that in Denmark, where there is a six-month reflection period, the trans community consider it patronising and were unsure of what they should be reflecting on. Having listened to trans people, they are now plans to remove this reflection period completely. If we are trying to give trans people more agency and autonomy over their legal gender status in this bill, it seems completely counter to this intention to impose another standard of authority by imposing a waiting period on them. We are telling trans people that we don't believe them when they tell us who they are. We are telling trans people that we, do not, that we don't think they do know their own minds. We should not be doing that. I urge my committee colleagues to assert that trans people do know their own minds and support my amendments. Thank you. Thank you. And Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, convener. Given that I have submitted amendments which intend to increase the period in which someone must live in the acquired gender to the status quo, 
I not only believe that the current proposal by the Scottish Government of three months is inadequate, but the absence of any reflection period could lead to young and distressed people rushing into life decision changes that they may re later regret. This is especially true if it is coupled with medical alterations such as hormone, puberty blockers and surgery. Furthermore, a reflection period could prevent so-called bad faith actors from taking advantage of these changes and intruding into single sex spaces. Weakening the provisions in this bill would make it even worse, and so I cannot support amendments 87, 88 and 89. However, I am happy to support one for one, because I believe it is important that the Scottish Government reviews the period in which a trans person is required to live in the acquired gender, although I know Maggie Chapman wishes to lower the period of time and I want to raise it. I think we can both find common ground that reviewing the evidence will allow for a more informed decision from the Scottish Government to be made in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And Pam, were you? Oh, Christine Graham. Thank you, convener. Can I say to uh, Maggie Chapman, I agree the majority of people do know their own minds, and many, and I've met them, have been living in a different gender for a long time before you would ever apply for gender recognition. But it's the majority, you're saying, but there are other people who will be transitional, who will have to have to have a period of thought about it. And I'm looking at the balance. That is those who already know, and they won't, if they've already been living in that for years, the three month period will be nothing to them, because they can demonstrate they've been doing it for years. Same with the 16 and 17 year olds for six months in advance and the reflection period. But there are people for whom I want to just have a little safeguard, particularly 16 and 17 year olds. And in no way does that take away from the autonomy of individuals. I met parents of a child of 10 who knew they were, in, they were really a girl. And he transitioned to she at primary. So I've been talking to people in both directions about this before I came with these amendments. So what I'm looking for here in law is something that works for as many people as possible and provides safeguards. So that's the only reason I would say to, to Maggie Chapman, I think we can't take away all protections and just say that or safeguards. Thank okay, you. Thank you. And Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Kavina, let me begin by saying I know these amendments reflect the views of Maggie Chapman that the time period for living in your required gender as well as the reflection period should be removed. And this is a position taken by uh, her throughout the passage of the bill and in our discussions on the matter. And of course, I respect that just as I do uh, the other views expressed during the passage of the bill, even if I, I don't agree with them. I know there are views that the time period should be longer or removed entirely or the reflection period should be removed, but usually with an increase in the time period for living in the acquired gender. I've not seen an alternative to our proposals that would be uh, accepted and keep to the principles of reforming the process. I consider the current requirement for applicants to provide evidence that they have been living in the required gender for a period of two years before applying to be unnecessarily long, a reduction in the time period to three months followed by the three month reflection period um, represents a review of a balanced and proportionate way of improving the system and obviously six months um, of uh, uh, living in the acquired gender for 16, 17 year olds of Christine Graham's amendments are accepted. I have, uh, however, uh, considered that uh, the reflection period could be a disproportionate barrier to people in the circumstances that they are at the end of life and appreciate that an important benefit of legally changing your gender is ensuring that your death is registered in the gender in which you lived. And that's why I have lodged an amendment to the bill uh, so that an applicant at the end of life can apply for a dispensation from the three-month reflection period uh, which will be taken in a, a later grouping. So for those reasons, I cannot support amendments 87, 88, 89 and 91. Uh, however, I do agree with Maggie Chapman that, that it will be important to keep this under review. There are, of course, several amendments that have been lodged to review and report on the operation and impact of the bill across a number of areas that we'll get to later um, this session. This one, uh, with, within this group, I'm happy to support and would urge the committee to support. It will be necessary um, for us to consider carefully what is possible and appropriate for us to gather information and data about and the impact 
of the time periods on trans people going through the application process is certainly an area that we can uh, take forward. I therefore support Amendment uh, 141 in principle, but would look to work with Maggie Chapman and other members ahead of Stage 3 to ensure that any report and review amendments agreed at Stage 2 coalesce around the same time frame. Okay, thank you. Maggie Chapman to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 87. Thanks very much, Joe. J just a few comments. Uh, just, just for clarity, Rachel Hamilton talked about medical procedures and ther therapies. Just to be clear, this has got nothing to do with an application for a gender recognition certificate. No pr medical process is required or expected as part of the gender recognition application process, and no a GRC is required to undergo any medical transition. On Christine Graham's comments, I do believe that you are sincere in, in your endeavours, sorry, in, in her endeavours and her position on, on this issue. I think we just fundamentally disagree how, how, how we come at that. And finally, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her comments and for the many interesting and helpful conversations we've had on, on this and, and other issues in this bill over, over the last many months. Um, I acknowledge her comments about the, the amendment we'll come to later about provisions for end of life, and, and, and I thank her for those. And I also thank her for her comments about my amendment 141. But I will be pressing my, my amendments that seek to remove the three-month uh, living in the, the acquired gender period and the three-month reflection period. Thank you. So I, I, I will press amendment 87. Thank you. So the question is, amendment 87 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? No, yes. no that is not agreed. Um, all those in favour of Amendments 87, please raise your hand. And all those against? Okay. Okay, that's one, four, six against. That amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call Amendment 88 in the name of Maggie Chapman. Already debated with Amendment 87. Maggie Chapman to move or not move? Move. Is that agreed? Yes. Okay. Um, all those in favour of Amendment 88, please show. And all those against? Okay, that is one for and six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call amendment 38 in the name of Christine Graham, already, already debated with amendment 18. Christine Graham to move or not move? Moved. The question is amendment 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I think I have some no's. Yep, yeah. okay. So the question is amendment 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Although, all those in favour, please raise your hand. Okay, and all those against? And abstentions? None. Okay, the vote three, is four, three, three, four, three against and one abstention, and I will cast my vote, casting vote for. The amendment is therefore agreed. So for. Can I get, can I get sorry. I thought you said three four. Three, if it, three, three four. Three. Oh, three, sorry. Three, three four. Right. Three, three against. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Apologies. Thank you. Thank you. Three four. Three against. One abstention. I will therefore use my casting vote to vote for, and so therefore the amendment is agreed to. Call amendment eight to nine in the name of Maggie Chapman. Already debated with amendment eight to seven. Maggie Chapman to move or not move. Moved. Okay. The, question is that Amendment 89 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. It's not agreed. Um, all those in favour of the amendment, please raise your hand. And all those against? Six. One in favour, so six, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call Amendment 3 in the name of Sue Weber, already debated with Amendment 2. Sue Weber to move or not move? Um, is anybody else moving it? Uh, no. Uh, not moved. Not moved, okay. Um, so the question is that section 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. That is agreed. I call amendment 39 in the name of Christine Graham, already debated with amendment 18. Christine Graham to move or not move? Moved, convener. The question is that amendment 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no. That is not agreed. All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against? And amendments? <laughs> abstentions? Sorry. One abstention. So that is uh, three, four, 
three against and one abstention. So again, I will use my casting vote. So the amendment, the, the amendment is agreed to. The question is, I call Amendment 40 in the name of Christine Graham, already debated with Amendment 18. Christine Graham, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. That is not agreed. Um, so we'll go to a vote. All the members who wish to vote for, please raise your hand. All those against? Abstention? That is, again, 3-3-1. Three, three, um, so I therefore use my casting vote to vote for. So the amendment is therefore agreed. Call Amendment 41 in the name of Christine Graham, already debated with Amendment 18. Christine Graham, to move or not move? move. The question is, Amendment 41 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. So, again, so we go to a vote. All, all members who wish to vote for, please vote. Please raise your hands. All those against, please raise your hands. Abstentions? Thank you. Again, th that three, vote is three, three for, three against, one abstention. one abstention. I'll use my casting vote for, and the amendment is therefore agreed to. I call Amendment 118 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 114. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Uh, not moved. Not moved. I call Amendment 119 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 114. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that 119, sorry, I call Amendment 120 in the name of Martin Whitfield, already debated with Amendment 18. Martin Whitfield, to, to move or not move? I'm, I'm grateful, Convener. Um, given the indication from the Government, I'll not move at this stage. Thank you. That's not moved. I therefore call Amendment 42 in the name of Christine Graham, already debated with Amendment 18. And I remind members that if Amendment 42 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 19 because of a preemption. Christine Graham, to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. So the question is that Amendment 42 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is not agreed. We therefore move to a vote. All members who wish to vote for, please raise your hands. All those who wish to vote against, please raise your hands. And abstentions? Yeah. Okay, that's um, three, four, three against, and one abstention. So I'll use my casting vote to vote for, and the amendment is therefore agreed. Um, so we therefore move straight to Amendment 90 in the name of Ros McCall, already debated with Amendment 83. Ros McCall to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved, thank you. Call Amendment 43 in the name of Christine Graham, already debated with Amendment 18. Christine Graham, to move or not move? Move, please. Question is, Amendment 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. That is not agreed, we therefore move to a vote. Um, all members who wish to vote for, please raise your hands. All those against? And abstentions? Okay, that's three for, three against, and one abstention. I therefore use my casting vote to vote for, and the amendment is therefore agreed to. I call Amendment 91 in the name of Maggie Chapman, debated with Amendment 87. Maggie Chapman, to move or not move? Moved. Um, as Amendment 91 would preempt Amendment 121, I will not put the question on Amendment 91 until Amendment 121 has been debated. Um, that said, we've come to a, a natural break. And so... Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. There's, there's no points of order, but... Oh, OK. Um, do you want to make a point? <laughs> Yes, I would appreciate that. Um, it's been uh, noted on social media that a member of the public who was present was wearing a scarf in the colours of purple, white and green and has been asked to either remove the scarf or leave the room. Um, can I seek some so guidance? I'm going to, I'm going to suspend the, the meeting. We'll have a discussion about this in, in private. We're suspending the meeting and we'll discuss guidance as to why this happened. Suspend.
Thank you. OK, I call Amendment 21 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, grouped with Amendments 1 to 2, 22 and 28. Pam Duncan Glancy to move Amendment 121 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, th thank you, convener. Um, amendment uh, 154, which is indeed yet to come in my name, set out, sets out that before someone applies to the Registrar General, they must make a statutory declaration signed by a Justice of the Peace, a solicitor, notary public or Commissioner for Oaths or any authorised other professional, that they are telling the truth and are fulfilling the criteria set out in the Act. My amendment in this group, 122, sets out that it is an offence to knowingly make a statutory declaration that is false. Together with my amendment 154, I believe these amendments to be crucial to help build support for the Bill. Statutory declarations are serious legal documents, carry great weight, and the public have confidence in them in other situations. As I have said on the record in the past, we need reform with a law that works for trans people, is administrative in nature, and carries the confidence of the public with it. In being signed by a respected group of people, statutory declarations are a well-known mechanism in which we trust and could help people to understand that this process is serious. The Government has not made this part of the process as clear to the public as necessary, including the seriousness of it, and my amendment seeks to address this. Amendment 121 and 122 make it clear that if at the time someone made a declaration they did not intend to comply with that criteria, they are committing a serious criminal offence. Thank you. Thank you. And Graham Simpson to speak to Amendment 22 and other amendments in the group. <clears throat> Thanks very much, uh, Convener. I won't be quite as brief as Pam Duncan Glancy, uh, but I will be, well, I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. I've got a couple of amendments uh, in, the, in the group, Convener. Um, in my view, they're quite straightforward. The bill proposes that it will be a criminal offence to make a false statutory declaration or false application. A person who commits such an offence is liable to imprisonment for up to two years uh, and or they'll, they'll get fined. However, what's not clear is what would constitute making a false declaration nor what prosecutors would have to prove should a person be accused of doing so. And you might say, well, it's obvious, isn't it? If I were to say that I'd been living as a woman for three months and I hadn't, then I would not be telling the truth. Of course, as we'll come to in, in later amendments, it's not clear at all from this bill what living as a woman or a man means legally. If I take something belonging to you, convener, that would constitute theft and I, would be, I could be prosecuted. Had I broken the speed limit uh, to get over to Edinburgh, then I could face penalty points. And if I tried to pin the blame on someone else for that offence, that would be a lie and I could be done for that. But how does anyone prove, or how would I prove, that if I say I'd been living as a woman, that I'd be lying? Given that we don't know what living as a woman means in this bill, then it's pretty difficult to establish if I were telling the truth. But this bill creates a serious offence, uh, punishable by imprisonment. It's surely incumbent on ministers to set out what would constitute making a false declaration. And Amendment 22 compels them to do that. It also compels them to set out what evidence would have to be provided to show that someone had lied. And if ministers can't do any of that, then it's difficult to see how an offence can be prosecuted, because we simply don't know what the offence is. And if we don't know what would constitute an offence, because we don't know how to prove or disprove it, then there can be no offence. So I say to those who are in favour of the bill, which I think is the majority of this committee, that it needs to be much tighter. Reject amendment, amendment 22 and there will be legal challenges galore coming along the tracks. And if the committee is minded to accept the amendment, then amendment 28 makes any regulations tabled as a result uh, to be subject to the affirmative procedure, which gives an extra layer of parliamentary scrutiny. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Um, and now you go to Cabinet Secretary. 
Thank you, uh, convener. I welcome the conversations that I've had with Pam Duncan Glancy about amendments requiring the statutory declaration to include confirmation that the applicant understands that making a false statutory declaration is an offence. It may be circular for the declaration about understanding that making a false declaration is an offence to then be subject to the offence provision itself. However, I consider that Pam Duncan Glancy's amendment will be an additional measure to ensure that the applicant is aware that making a false statutory declaration is an offence, just as the notary public or justice of the peace administering the statutory declaration is required to ensure the person understands the contents of what they are signing. So I would ask the committee to support this amendment. It's already an offence to knowingly make a false statutory declaration with the maximum penalty for both the offence being imprisonment for up to two years or an unlimited fine or both. The offence provision in section 14 of the bill also already provides that the offences made if the declaration or other information in an application is false in a material particular and it is the same position for the existing uh, offence. The amendments proposed by Graham Sim Simpson would require ministers to make regulations about what would constitute a false statutory declaration and the evidence required. But as the committee will be aware, pr prosecutorial policy is for the Lord Advocate rather than ministers. And with, as with any criminal offence, it would be a matter for the police and the procurator fiscal to demonstrate and the courts to determine where an offence has been committed in any individual case. Um, Graeme Simpson made reference to living in the acquired gender, but of course the point here is there's no change to what living in an acquired gender means. It's exactly the same as in the 2004 Act. The requirement is not about looking or dressing a certain way, but about the ways in which a person may demonstrate their lived gender to others. And in this respect, as I said, it doesn't change the position that applies in the current 2004 Act, under which examples of appropriate evidence of living in the acquired gender include updating uh, official documents, such as updating driving licence or passport, utility bills or bank accounts, and there's a number of other examples uh, given uh, within the, the uh, 2004 uh, legislation. Uh, so, uh, with all of that said, I therefore urge the committee not to support amendments 22 and 28. Thank you. And I move to Pam Duncan Glancy to wind up and press or withdraw amendment 121. Uh, thank, thank you, convener. And um, I thank the cabinet secretary for the response and for the the, the helpful conversations that we've we've had around um, my, my amendments in this group. Um, and I, I press amendment 121. Okay. Thank you. That is pressed. But before putting the question on that amendment, I will first put the question on Amendment 91, already moved by Maggie Chapman. So the question is that Amendment 91 in the name of Maggie Chapman be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is not agreed. Um, so all those in favour, please vote. And all those against. And abstentions. Can you get away? Palm. Okay, thank you. So that's one for so and six against, against no and no abstentions. It is therefore not agreed to. Um, so, that, so it's not agreed. So I now put the question on Amendment 121, already moved by Pam Duncan Glancy. So the question is that Amendment 121, in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. That is agreed. Yes. Okay, thank you. Call Amendment 44 in the name of Christine Graham, already debated with Amendment 18. Christine Graham, to move or not move? Moved. So the question is that Amendment 44 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is not agreed. Um, therefore, move to a vote. All members who wish to vote for, please vote. All those against? And abstentions? Okay, that is three for, three against, and one abstention. So I will use my casting vote to vote for, so the amendment is therefore agreed to. I call Amendment 122 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with Amendment 121. Pam Duncan Glancy to move or not move? Yes. Question is that Amendment 122 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. That is agreed. I call Amendment 45 in the name of Michael Mara, grouped with Amendments 48 and 154. Michael Mara to move Amendment 45 and speak to all amendments in the group. 
Thank you, Convener. Um, my amendments 45 and 48 seek to address concerns of the, the broad public uh, regarding the robustness of the legislation. And we're absolutely clear uh, that Scotland requires a better system for trans people. Um, and there's always been, already been discussion this morning around bad faith actors. And I believe that the system currently proposed could be improved to command broader public support across Scotland. Uh, so the system must be robust for trans people and for non-trans people. And in particular, we must recognise the very real concerns of women regarding the possibility of abuse of the system. So this legislation is not a mere amendment to the 2004 Act. The demedicalisation of the process, which Labour supports, is a profound change to the nature of the process, and it opens it up very considerably. The government recognises that, and in fact, it's one of the core purposes of the bill. Uh, as such, that requires a different manner of safeguard against those who might abuse the legislation legislation, um, and a balance must be struck as it stands. I believe more could be done to achieve this. So my amendment is modelled on the process for obtaining a passport. Uh, that's a well understood and commonly respected process for changing your personal details. It applies to every single one of us. And when you change this documentation, you require a signature from a person of good standing whom you know. Uh, the effect of the amendments would be to ensure that an application is made as part of the community rather than as a solitary individual. So I'm happy to thank the Cabinet Secretary and our officials for engagement on the amendment. Um, the Cabinet Secretary has indicated so far that the statutory declaration uh, is a sufficient safeguard. And I ask her to put her thinking on this on the record at this stage. Um, I believe that that reasoning has not particularly featured uh, in that regard in any of the discussion of the bill in consultation and ministerial correspondence in the Stage 1 report or in the Stage 1 debate. So it would be good to hear the rationale from the Cabinet Secretary at this time. So, and I do have concerns that a statutory declaration uh, on its own could be seen as transactional. Um, it amounts to a small fee being paid to a lawyer to witness a signature and to say that existing doc identity documents have been produced. It's not about knowing someone. Uh, so the broader effect of the amendment would be to raise the bar for bad actors and it can increase the confidence for trans people seeking recognition. So I'm keen to hear from other members and the Cabinet Secretary on the sufficiency um, of the statutory declaration as part of the, the existing leg uh, proposed legislation um, and on the rationale for a passport system being too high a bar for this process but being appropriate in the case of changing personal details for every member of the public. Um, thank you, Camilla. So I can um, ask you to move your amendment. Please. I have moved my amendment. Thank you. And Pam Duncan Glancy to speak to Amendment 154 and other amendments in the group. I, I thank the con convener um, for, for this. As, as I said previously, um, Amendment 154 in my name sets out that before someone applies to the Registrar General, they must make a statutory declaration signed by a Justice of the Peace, a solicitor, a notary public or a commissioner for oath or any other authorised professional that they are telling the truth and are fulfilling the criteria in the Act. My amendment in this group, um, in the previous group, set out that it was an offence to knowingly make a, a statutory declaration that is false. Um, and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. And Pam Gossel. Thank you, Dina. I'm happy to support all amendments in this group. Amendments 45 and 48 add a new safeguard to the bill that would require a process of counter signatures to accompany any new application for a gender recognition certificate, similar to the process when applying for a passport. While the Scottish Conservatives will be supporting this amendment, we would also like to be clear that this safeguard isn't enough but it is an improvement on the existing provision in the Bill, which is why we will support it. I would prefer that the existing safeguards that currently exist in the law were retained, as my colleagues have already set out. In particular, keeping the age at which one can apply for a GRC to 18, the period in which one has to live in an acquired gender remaining at two years, and the need for a medical diagnosis when applying for a GRC. However, Michael Mara's amendments are an improvement on the bill as drafted, so I am content to support. Amendment 154 provides a concrete definition of what a statutory declaration entails. Again, I would put on record that I do not think this is enough. Applications should also be accompanied with an associated medical diagnosis and a longer period of time lived in the acquired gender. But given that the Scottish Government have failed to provide properly define, sorry, properly define 
what a statutory declaration entails. Amendment 154 at least provides a definition that already exists in law and has been used for some time, namely the definition provided in the Statutory Declaration Act 1835. This hopefully provides more clarity than the Bill has drafted, which is why I am happy to support. Thank you. And Maggie Chapman, please. Thank you very much, Joe. I, I find Michael Mara's amendments very, very problematic in, in, in this grouping. One of the key principles of this bill is that of self-declaration, that trans people should be able to get a gender recognition certificate by a process of self-identification. That is what over two-thirds of us agreed at stage one a couple of weeks ago. But Amendment 48 would require a person from a listed recognised profession who has known the applicant for at least two years to countersign the trans person's application. This is fundamentally at odds with the idea that this bill is based on the, idea, the principle of self-declaration. It creates additional barriers to legal recognition for some trans people. For the avoidance of doubt, statutory declarations are not something that you can make to a friend or a neighbour on a whim. They are sworn statements made under oath and witnessed by either a justice of the peace, local councillor or notary public. And making a false statutory declaration carries a sentence of up to two years in prison. This is already a significant and serious step. And there is, in my opinion, and that of many who work with and support trans people, as well as trans people themselves, no value in requiring an additional step through counter -sign signatories. Michael Mara makes the equation with the passport application process, but passport applications do not require a statutory declaration, simply a witness. It is not appropriate for an outsider to have to confirm a person's gender identity. For more socially isolated trans people, it could also be difficult for them to find a recognised professional, according to the list in Amendment 48, who has known them for two years. And I do not think that this should prevent them from obtaining legal, legal recognition of who they are. So I would strongly ask colleagues to vote against the, the, these amendments. Thank you. Thank you. And Fulton McGregor, please. Um, I'm all well intentioned. Um, I, I, I can't um, find myself able to support uh, Michael Maris' uh, amendments here. Um, I think I don't think the um, analogy of the it being similar to passports is um, is a good one, um, because the purpose of this bill is to make the process easier for trans people, and that's at the, the core of the bill. Um, as I spoke about earlier, he talks about it raises the bar for bad faith actors. You know, we've had a discussion about bad faith actors, and I think we do need to use this process, both stage two and stage three, to, um, as Pam Duncan Glancy's previous amendment um, looked at, and I think we do, need to, we do need to do more on that. But this particular amendment raises the bar for all trans people and therefore goes against the whole principles of the bill, which the committee has taken um, a lot of evidence on and produced a stage one report on, and therefore uh, I wouldn't be supporting these amendments. Thank you. And Karen Adam, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, I'll be voting against the, the Michael Mara's amendments here. It's really problematic in that it's very middle class focused. We really have to look at the variety of people that will be coming forward for a GRC. This um, amendments. These amendments are not inclusive of those people from various different backgrounds. Um, I think we have to be careful. Sometimes we say the words um, safeguarding when in fact it is gatekeeping and that's what I feel this is. It's certainly gatekeeping. It is against all principles of the bill. Gender recognition reform is to make the process more progressive and easier for trans people to obtain a gender recognition certificate. And I don't believe that these amendments will do that. So I'll be voting against them. OK, thank you. And Cabinet Secretary, please. Thanks, Convener. Uh, let me begin by taking a moment to set out the process uh, as you've had uh, from me in writing. So before making an application to the Registrar General, the person must first make a statutory de declaration. In the statutory declaration, the applicant must declare that they are aged at least 16, are born or are ordinarily resident in Scotland, have lived in their acquired gender for at least the previous three months or six months for 16, 17 year olds, 
and intend to live permanently in their acquired gender. A statutory declaration is a, an existing feature of the current process for obtaining legal gender recognition and one that we are maintaining in our system. A statutory declaration is a serious and significant matter and in Scotland statutory declarations under the bill will be made in the presence of a notary public or a justice of the peace. Guidance is provided by the Law Society of Scotland to solicitors on acting as a notary public. The notary must be satisfied as to the identity of the applicant based on evidence if the person is not known to them and they must be satisfied that the applicant understands the contents of the statutory declaration. This could uh, require photographic identification such as passport or driving licence. A statutory declaration is like an affidavit and is a formal statement that something is true to the best of the knowledge of the person making the declaration. It is provided for by the long-standing Statutory Declarations Act 1835 and is an accepted way of establishing facts in numerous official contexts. It is a criminal offence to knowingly make a false statutory declaration or provide false information in an application and the maximum penalty for these offences is imprisonment for up to two years or an unlimited fine or indeed both. Once a person has made the required statutory declaration, you must then provide this to the Registrar General when they make an application for a GRC with all of the safeguards associated with that stage. I welcome the discussion I had with Michael Marr about his proposed amendments. However, I consider that the statutory declaration is sufficient. His amendments do not materially add to the requirement to make a statutory declaration. Indeed, uh, as others have said, they add uh, further barriers for a person to access their rights with a prescriptive list of recognised professions within Amendment 48. I do have concerns about the countersigning requirement, that might work, how it might work in practice. For example, where an individual has been living in their acquired gender for a long time, it might require them to disclose their trans status to someone they've known for years, who may be completely unaware of that. I understand that applying for your passport involves a countersignatory process. However, applying for your passport does not involve making a statutory declaration. And as I said er earlier, that statutory declaration itself could well require photographic identification, such as a passport or driving licence. And finally, the statute of declaration is clearly a higher threshold, given there are criminal offences associated. Thank you. I think Rachel Hamilton has a question for the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. Um, can I just get clarification on the point you made there about um, the notary public? I presume that's in reference to um, being witnesses of declaration of living in the acquired gender. Uh, who are those notary public? Do they include city councillors? Well, notary publics are quite often solicitors and justice of the, the peace um, can sometimes be city councillors, um, but they're well established in a number of pieces of legislation uh, and the Law Society of Scotland uh, has guidance uh, to solicitors that are acting as a notary public. So, thank you for that. So, um, despite some uh, murmurs from the side, city councillors can be included in that. Well, justice of the peace um, sometimes are city councillors. I, I think Co correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I am now go to Michael Mara to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment Forty Five. Uh, thanks, Kavira, and uh, uh, thanks to uh, committee members for the, for the feedback and the discussion of the amendment. I particularly take on board the constructive comments from Fulton McGregor and Karen Adam um, regarding the, some of the, the detail, uh, specific detail. With it. I, I disagree that it's uh, the, um, the, the, the more broad sense that it is against the principles of the bill. The bill, as it stands, significantly liberalises the process, and rightly so. And the demedicalisation achieves that. Um, this is about where the legislation currently stands and putting in, pray, in place. Um, a further safeguard within that. Um, so I do not agree that it's against uh, the, the principle of the bill. Um, that being said, um, I'm very keen uh, to look for a sensible centre ground that can command the broadest possible public support. I still think there's work to be done in this area and taking on board those comments from, from colleagues. Um, I would ask members to allow me to continue per to pursue conversations with colleagues um, in committee and elsewhere. Um, and so at this stage, I would ask leave to withdraw um, the amendment. Okay, thank you, Mr Mara. Mr Mara has asked um, to withdraw Amendment 45. Is that agreed? It's not, not agreed. Um, can I ask that this goes to the vote? Because I would like to see the conclusion of the committee at this stage. Okay. 
Okay, in that case, we do go to the vote, and the question is that Amendment 45 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yeah. That is not agreed. So, all those who wish to vote for, please raise your hands. I'll just check this is 45. This is 45, yes. All those against? And abstention? Okay, that is two for, four against, and one abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 46 in the name of Christine Graham, already de debated with amendment 18. Christine Graham, to move or not move? Move, please. Okay, the question therefore is that amendment 46 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is not agreed. Um, so we go to the vote. All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against? And abstention? That's three for, three against, one abstention. I therefore use my casting vote to vote for, and the amendment is therefore agreed to. Call amendment 123 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with amendment 114. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Uh, move. The question is, amendment 123 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. That is not agreed, um, so therefore move to the vote. All those in favour, please vote. Okay, all those against? And abstentions? No. So that's two for, four against, and no abstention. Five against. Five against, sorry. Two for, two for, two for five against, and no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call amendment 47 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Cabinet Secretary, to move amendment 47 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, let's get to my bit. Uh, the first uh, ten uh, amendments in this group uh, seek a change uh, in the bill as introduced. Uh, currently, the bill requires the Registrar General to grant an application for a gender recognition certificate if the applicant meets the requirements of the bill. Um, this means that if the Registrar General considers an application was fraudulent or the applicant was not able to understand it, they would first have to issue the certificate if the applicant otherwise met the requirements and then apply to the Sheriff for the certificate to be revoked. Uh, to avoid this situation, these 10 amendments would allow the Registrar General to apply to the Sheriff before a certificate is issued. This is much more appropriate than the Registrar General first issuing the certificate than applying to the sheriff, sheriff for it to be revoked. The court would then determine whether the application should be uh, rejected or should proceed. Amendment 67 adds uh, to the grounds on which a person with an interest can apply for revocation of uh, a GRC, specifically in the case of a confirmatory GRC if the overseas gender recognition that was the basis for it has subsequently ceased to have effect. So if overseas gender recognition has been revoked for whatever reason, an application for revocation of the confirmatory GRC could be made. This is unlikely to be used frequently, but given that the overseas gender recognition is the basis for a conf confirmatory GRC, it is reasonable to uh, provide for this eventuality. Finally, uh, Amendment 68 provides clarity that the standard of proof for an application to a sheriff is that on the balance of probabilities, the GRC application it was fraudulent. This is consistent with the usual standard of proof in a civil case, rather than the criminal standard of beyond reasonable doubt. That is appropriate given the sheriff's decision in this case is on whether the GRC should be revoked, not on a criminal offence. I move Amendment 47. Given there are no um, other people indicating to speak, Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to um, wind up? I don't think I've got and anything else to add, Convener. OK, and, and I take it you're pressing the amendment? I will press, yes, thanks. OK, so the question is that Amendment 47 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. I call Amendment 124 in the name of Martin Whitfield, already debated with Amendment 18. that amendment. Okay, so not, not moved. Thank you. Question is, sorry, 
I call Amendment 20 in the name of Graham Simpson, grouped with Amendments 20, 27, 29 and 30. Graham Simpson to move Amendment 20 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thanks again, uh, convener. Um, this section is called Meaning of Living in the Acquired Gender. It's pretty fundamental uh, to, to the bill. I've searched high and low for an explanation of what has to happen if someone was to say, if a man was to say they were uh, a woman. Surely the bill does not allow someone to simply say, a man to simply say, I'm a woman, get a certificate saying so without providing evidence of anything and then having that legally recognised through a change to a birth certificate or, or am I missing something? I don't think I am. The bill says I would have to live as a woman for three months. But if we're going to bring in a bill as fundamental to people's lives as this, then we need to be clear what is meant by it. The bill is woolly at best and that's not good enough. If we're going to allow people to make declarations that they've changed gender, then surely the law should say what is meant by that. And the bill doesn't do that. Indeed, the bill doesn't say anything about it, which is particularly concerning if we're moving towards a model of self-identification. Surely something has to have changed in order for someone to say, I was a man, but now I'm a woman, or vice versa. Amendment 20 is another attempt by me to tighten up a bill that is full of holes. It does two things. Firstly, it says that ministers must say in regulations what they mean by living in the acquired gender. And secondly, they must say what changes would be considered evidence that a new gender has been acquired. Convener, it's not for me to say what such changes should be, just that there should be some. Otherwise, we'll, we'll be left with a situation where it's easier for predatory men to prey on women by pretending to be women because of having a certificate without any of the current safeguards that exist in law. A piece of paper, which as the bill is currently drafted, proves precisely nothing. Amendment 27 makes those regulations subject to the affirmative procedure and 29 and 30 are technical amendments which are consequential. Thank you. And Cabinet Secretary. Thanks, Convener. Um, living in the acquired gender means living your daily life in a gender that is different to your gender recorded at birth. In the context of the bill, this is the gender you are living in when you make an application. Applicants will have to make a statutory declaration that they have lived in their acquired gender for a minimum of three months, uh, six months for 16 and 17 year olds before applying and intend to do so for the rest of their life. The aim of the bill is to improve the process for those applying for legal gender recognition as the current system can have an adverse impact on applicants due in part to the burdensome evidence requirements. The bill establishes a more straightforward process based on the statutory declaration. As I indicated earlier, the requirement is not about looking or dressing a certain way, but about the ways in which a person may demonstrate their lived gender to others. In this respect, the bill does not change the position that applies in the current 2004 Act, under which examples of appropriate evidence of living in the acquired gender include updating official documents, such as updating driving licence or passport, utility bills or bank accounts. There are numerous other examples provided within the guidance to the 2004 Act, which has now been in place for 18 years. I don't guess... Uh, certainly. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in what the Cabinet Secretary is saying here. Can you give, can you spell out some of these numerous other examples? So, the, uh, as the, the guidance of the 2004 Act uh, uses examples that uh, include consistently using titles and pronouns in line with the acquired gender, updating the gender marker official documents such as driving licence or passport, updating utility bills or bank accounts, describing themselves and being described by others in written or, or other communication in line with their acquired gender, using a name that is associated with the acquired gender, um, and yeah, and none. I mean, these are examples of what could constitute living in the acquired gender. And in this respect, the bill really doesn't change the position that applies uh, in the 2004 Act uh, currently. 
Um, so I don't consider that um, amendments that require applicants to provide evidence that have been living in their acquired gender beyond that of the statutory declaration would be in keeping with the general principles of the bill as supported by the Parliament at stage one and would introduce uh, another set of barriers uh, to people. For that reason, I ask the committee to reject uh, Graeme Simpson's amendments. OK, and I think Rachel Hamilton has a question, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. And it's again a point of clarification, Cabinet Secretary. On the 6th of October, the committee agreed that interpretations of living in the acquired gender could lead to reinforcing of gender stereotypes and that this would be unacceptable to enshrine in law. Do you agree with that? Well, that's why I've just said the requirement is not about looking or dressing a certain way, but about the ways in which a person may demonstrate their lived gender to others. And I've given examples of how that might be done in documentation about how people are living their lives and are able to provide uh, evidence of that. And I think National Records of Scotland will provide guidance to applicants on how to make an application and will be able to refer uh, to some of these examples that are based on the guidance in the 2004 Act. Again, again, to clarify, that will be in the guidance for the um, Register General, that there will be a definition of living in an We are going gender. to try and provide as much information as possible, but it will be based on what's already in the 2004 Act and those examples. But, yeah, we want to provide as much um, clarity and information to people as possible. So the Register General website will have uh, all of that information. Okay, thank you. And Graeme Simpson to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 20. Thank, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I always think it's useful um, in uh, stages two and three uh, of a bill to listen to what is being said by people who you may have assumed we, you were disagreeing with. Um, but actually, um, I think there is probably some common ground between myself uh, and the Cabinet Secretary. She may not realise it, but um, I think... Uh, <laughs> I, I actually think that that possibly is, and, and she can intervene on me at any point. Um, I was in, in, in Amendment 20 simply seeking to get the government at some point to spell out what we mean by the acquired gender, because I've seen no, nothing of that until today. And the Cabinet Secretary listed a few things. So I think, um, you know, I... Th I I would be happy to work with the Cabinet Secretary uh, ahead of Stage 3 to see if there is something that we could insert into this bill based on what she said uh, that would help to clarify matters if she is prepared to do that. And I'll invite her to respond to that. Well, I've always taken an approach that, you know, I've kept an open door and I've spoken to, to people across the Chamber from all of the, the, the political uh, groupings uh, around uh, all of these matters. Um, I, I mean, I think my principle here would be to not move uh, beyond the examples given in the 2004 Act, because I think they provide clarity. Um, I think where we will want to make sure that people are aware, and I take uh, Graeme Simpson's point about you know the different aspects that are highlighted and the information that, that we need to make sure people are aware of, I think that's where, for example, the Registrar General uh, website, where every bit of information about the whole process can be put in the one place, we'd be able to include those examples. Where I would be reluctant is to put anything kind of on the face of the bill that goes beyond the 2004 Act. But if there is any further information in, in guidance or on the website that Graeme Simpson thinks would be helpful, then of course I'm happy to have that conversation. I'm happy to have the conversation anyway, um, but I, I just can't guarantee I would go beyond the 2004 Act, but happy to, to speak to Graeme Simpson further. Well, I, I think that's very helpful. I can I, I can see the cabinet secretary uh, uh, struggling to agree with me, as, uh, but um, uh, on, on on that base, you know, I, I'm I'm going to help her uh, because I'm going to engage with her. Um, I won't press this amendment um, because I think that we can find some common ground. Um, I hope we can ahead of stage three, um, and I think that will be helpful to to everyone. Um, I think. Um, you know, as, as, as members know, experienced members know, um, certainly those of us who've uh, been on the DPLR committee know, um, it is very difficult for um, not, not just MSPs, but certainly members of the public to jump about between certain pieces of legislation. So it's quite useful 
to have uh, everything in one place. So I think um, uh, I will not press 20 uh, on the basis that I think we can work on something okay. for stage okay. three. The, the member is seeking to withdraw amendment 20. Is that agreeable to the committee? That is. On that basis, we then move to amendment four in the name of Sue Weber, already debated with amendment two. Thank you. Not moved. Um, so the question is that section four be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. Thank you. Call amendment 48 in the name of Michael Mara, already debated with amendment 45. Not moved. Okay. Thank you. Um, I call amendment 92 in the name of Ros McCall, already debated with amendment 83. Ros McCall to move or not move. Sorry, is it 94? 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. 94. So the question is that Amendment 125 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. That is not agreed, so we move to a vote. Um, all those who wish to vote yes, please raise your hands. All those against, please vote. And abstentions? Two, four, five against and zero amend, uh, abstentions. Um, so therefore the amendment is not agreed to. I call amendment 126 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, group with amendments as shown in the groupings. Pam Duncan Glancy to move amendment 126 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, and if, if you'll give me a second to get to my correct notes pages for uh, 126. The... The Amendment 126, in, in my name, um, intends to ensure that people nearing the end of their life do not have to wait unnecessarily to have their gender um, recognised in legislation. So I submitted this amendment because I believe that the reflection period should be waived for people in that situation. I recognise that the government also have an amendment in this area. And I welcome their agreement to work on this for stage three. The definition I have included is the one used in social security in Scotland, and I think it's a good one. I won't press this amendment, but I'd welcome the government's agreement to working with us to ensure that people at the end of their life get a gender recognition certificate as quickly as possible, and to consider the definition of terminal illness we have put forward as outlined in the social security legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 49 mm. and other amendments in the group. Thanks, Convener. Uh, whilst not a, a specific recommendation of the Stage 1 report, the committee did highlight differing views uh, to the reflection period and invite me to consider it further. And I've uh, noted the Stage 1 evidence that the reflection period could be a disproportionate barrier where an applicant is nearing the end of their life because of illness. Uh, as I said in earlier groupings, we remain of the view that the reduction in the minimum period of living in the acquired gender to three months, um, six months for 16, 17-year-olds, combined with the introduction of a three-month reflection period, uh, represents a balanced and proportionate way of reducing the length of the overall process. However, in the response to the uh, committee stage one report, I undertook to introduce amendments to create a dispensation to allow the waiving of the three-month reflection period in cases where the applicant is nearing the end of their life. The amendments in this group in my name create that uh, dispensation. They have been developed in consultation with the National Records of Scotland and reflect the process and provisions for similar dispensations applying to marriage under the Marriage Scotland Act 1977. This would require the Register General to be satisfied that the applicant is gravely ill and not expected to recover. In practice, this would be established through a letter from the applicant's doctor confirming this, and the detail of this would be set out in guidance. Again, this reflects the equivalent process with marriage applications. Amendment 73 also ensures that a fraudulent application for dispensation would also be included in the offence created by the bill. The amendment from Pam Duncan-Glancy um, 
seems to have a similar goal but takes a, a different and, in my view, a narrower uh, approach. It disapplies the, the requirement for notification after a reflection period where the applicant is terminally ill rather than empowering the Registrar General to waive it. I would understand why uh, that approach might seem more attractive. However, in practice, the Registrar General, in either version, would need to establish that the individual is indeed near the end of life. Uh, we're also not seeking to provide a definition of an end-of-life illness such as this amendment does, recognising that someone could be gravely ill at the end of life due to old age, for example, not just through a terminal illness uh, due to a progressive disease, as outlined in uh, Pam Duncan Glancy's amendment. And whilst this is uh, appropriate in the Social Security Scotland Act 2018, where a, a definition was needed to access disability benefits at a higher rate and on a fast track, I don't believe it's uh, appropriate here, where we are waiving a reflection period for someone at the end of life uh, due to uh, illness um, or old age. The use of gravely ill and not expected to recover in my amendments matches the wording in the Marriage Act and the Registrar General is familiar with making dispensations on that basis already. It's preferable to align this provision with that for marriage rather than for Social Security because it's more closely, uh, it's a more closely comparable situation. And this provision is designed for cases where there's a high risk the applicant will die before an important change to their legal status can be made, one which is important to accurately record uh, before death. Um, so. I, I, would, I would ask the committee to reject uh, Pam Duncan Glancy's amendment and to accept the amendments in my name. I am, of course, happy to continue discussions with Pam Duncan Glancy, but I'm hoping what I've set out to the committee is a rationale for why it's more appropriate um, to uh, align um, the requirements uh, with, with that already recognised for marriage rather than uh, Social Security legislation. Thank you. And Rachel Hamilton, I think, has a question. Yeah, it, it on the basis of what Pam Duncan Glancy said, Cabinet Secretary, I am sy sympathetic to her um, amendment and um, so is my colleague Pam Duncan Glancy. But I just want reassurance that um, are you expecting a Register General to make a clinical judgment on a person who is terminally ill rather than a healthcare professional? Uh, no, that's why I said that in practice this would be established through a letter from the applicant's doctor confirming that the, the person is gravely ill and not expected to recover, and the detail of that would be set out in guidance. So it wouldn't be for the Registrar General to decide. It would be on the basis of the clinical uh, information provided uh, to the Registrar General. However, it wouldn't be on the face of the bill. Uh, well, it would be in, in guidance. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Pam Duncan Glancy to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 126. I thank the convener um, for this opportunity and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for setting that out on the record. Um, I, I'm satisfied with the way in which you have described what you're, what you're trying to do. I was seeking to make this not narrower but, but broader. Um, but I understand the, the Cabinet Secretary's rationale and so I will not press my amendment and I will vote for the Cabinet Secretary's amendments. Okay, thank you. So the member is seeking permission to withdraw Amendment 126. Are we agreed? Yeah. Okay, on that basis I... Call Amendment 127 in the name of Russell Finlay, already, already debated with Amendment 114. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Move. The question is, Amendment 127 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed, so we move to the vote. All members who wish to vote yes, um, please raise your hands. And all the, those against, please raise. Okay. Pam, you were yes, weren't you? Two seconds. Sorry. To, just so I can get my papers in order. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. Um, sorry, sorry to hold up proceedings. Um, you said one one seven. Sorry, it's one it's one two seven, Pam. One two seven. Yeah. Thank well, you. Let's just quickly take the vote again, just to, to, to make it clear, because clerks need to take a note. So, all those in favour of Amendment one two seven, please vote. Okay. And all those against. And abstention. Okay, that's two for, four against and one abstention. So the amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call amendment 128 in the name of Sarah Boyack, grouped with amendment 71. Sarah Boyack to move amendment 128 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. Um, 
Amendment 128 builds on point 278 of the committee's stage one report. Um, it talks about uh, the, the aim of this amendment is to require Scottish ministers to take steps to ensure that appropriate support and information is put in place to support any individual who is considering and or makes an application to a gender recognition certificate. And in my opinion, the, the wording of the amendment gives the flexibility that we need. It would be for Scottish ministers to determine what the appropriate support and information is, but this flexibility will actually ensure that the information support provided can be tailored to the needs of an individual. And also it can change over time as is required with the experience of the legislation. The committee recommended in its stage one report that the Scottish Government commit to appropriate support and signposting be put in place. And I strongly welcome that recommendation. Um, it followed the, the evidence in the committee, which you heard, particularly from the Children's Commissioner, who said in oral evidence that protection and participation rights are not mutually exclusive, and we're looking for a process that recognises not only the growing autonomy of young people, but the need to support and protect them. And I think the evidence heard by the committee reflects the concerns raised to me by constituents across the Lothians who've actually already gone through the process of um, obtaining a GRC. And they definitely welcome the simplification of the process for the future. But they have highlighted to me that one thing that would have been much more helpful for them would have been signposting and advice and support. Um, and they would have welcomed that before they transitioned. So they think that for future, particularly given that more people are likely to take the opportunity of a DRC, that we need to see support in place and provided for them. Now, in some cases, it could be health support and intervention, but actually the latest public health Scotland data for June 2022 shows that only 70% of children and young people referred to CAMS were seen within the 18-week waiting time target and similarly the waiting times for gender identity clinics currently ranges from anywhere between one and a half and three years time so there's a real issue here about could we make sure that a range of advice is available for people and I do want to reiterate it's not solely focused on medical support and or, or intervention although that is important but there's a range of non-medical advice and support that could be provided to people who are considering going through the GRC process, including from the public and voluntary sectors. So we're looking for signposting, looking for a commitment in principle, but I've, I've been quite careful not to be specific because I'm conscious that uh, if it's too specific, the Cabinet Secretary will no doubt immediately rule me out of order. But I'm trying to frame this in a way that I hope will be helpful and reflects what the committee concluded in its evidence. Um, thank you, Convener. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Um, we now call Christine Graham to speak to Amendment 71 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Uh, speak to Amendment 71, supported by Jackson Carlaw. Now, this amendment inserts a new section publication of information about the process setting out a duty, mandatory, on the Registrar General to publish online information uh, covering inter alia the effect of a gender recognition certificate, how to make an application for same, the requirement to make a statutory declaration before applying, the consequences of making a false application, and one of my amendments has actually it changed that for 16 and 70 rules, which to date will not make that a criminal offence. And, and the catch-all, which is very useful when setting out these, is other relevant information that the Re Register General considers appropriate. This will ensure all applicants can easily access information to inform them on their decision to apply for a GRC. I've also had clarification from the Scottish Government, and this addresses something raised by Sarah Boyk, that it remains the intention that the National Register would signpost 16 and 17 year olds to appropriate sources of support. Similarly, NRS would signpost all applicants to information on how to make a statutory declaration. And addressing specifically, I think, the well-intentioned amendment name of Sarah Boyk, I just think it's too broad. For example, you say ministers take steps don't know what that means. Uh, have access, the applicants have access to appropriate support and information. Is that before the application, the application process are about transitioning more or what about the appropriate support and information would be? Now, some of this has been dealt with in my earlier amendment in 39 about uh, certainly 16 and 70 year olds and of course anybody over that age 
uh, requiring taking um, advice and support and counselling from appropriate people and even from another adult. 16 and 70 year olds, it's mandatory. It's not from other adults. So I think mine is, you know, I think it's well intentioned, but mine is much more specific and links in to earlier amendments that were put in again for support and advice at the point when you even go and make an application itself. So I think to some extent that's tightened up the, um, the bill. That's all I have to say, which was enough. OK, thank you. And Cabinet Secretary. Thanks, Convener. Um, I've said uh, throughout the passage of this bill that it's essential that all applicants for a, a GRC have carefully considered this important legal step, understand the effect of doing so, and are able to access information and guidance to inform this uh, consideration. I do welcome the discussions I've, I've had with uh, Sarah Boyack. Um, Sarah Boyack's amendment would place a a legal requirement on Scottish ministers to take steps to ensure that those considering an application have access to uh, quotes, appropriate support and information, but it leaves open a lot of questions about what specifically that appropriate support and information would be. It's not clear, for example, whether it relates to the process and legal effect of gender recognition or wider support for people considering a uh, transition generally. It also raises the, the possibility of legal challenge to the specific meaning of appropriate in this context. And uh, just also to reiterate that uh, the NRS will signpost uh, people to other organisations who can provide uh, specialist support uh, to applicants. Um, and it's for those reasons that I, I can't support Sarah Boyack's uh, amendment and urge the, the committee uh, to reject. Uh, Christine Graham's more specific amendment sets out the information that the Registrar General should publish covering the process of applying the effect of a GRC, the statutory declaration requirement and the consequences of a false application. And this is in line with what the Registrar General has already committed to in evidence to, to the committee. So I therefore ask the committee to support uh, Christine uh, Graham's amendment. Okay, thank you. Sarah Boyer. Question? Sorry, question. Rachel Hamilton. Um, Cabinet Secretary, uh, I am very supportive of Sarah Boyack's um, amendment and I'm disappointed that uh, you've highlighted that it is inconsistencies, despite Sarah Boy Boyack saying at the outset that it was a, a generalised kind of um, probing, although she's moved it. Um, I do think it could be complementary by um, giving Scottish ministers the, um, you know, the duty to to report on some of these um, th these things that uh, Sarah Boyk is trying to bring forward, and um, because it complements um, the reporting requirements that Christine Graham is seeking, as well as the data collection. And normally, with data collection, the Scottish ministers are responsible for that. So, I I would seek um, you to change your mind and to work with the Conservatives and Labour um, to. To, to work together for something that we can all agree on because quite frankly um, this process um, hasn't really had much of a, a cross-party consensus and I think this is one area that we can work together on. So uh, let me just say first of all I don't think Sarah Boyack's uh, amendment is really regarding reporting as such it's about the appropriate support and information um, that would be made available uh, to people and I think we have to be clear about what that is and who provides it, what it's for. If it's about the process then that is already going to be provided for. Uh, the additional safeguards in Christine Graham's amendment uh, lay out the process specifically for 16, 17 uh, year olds. So I think all of that uh, is, is there. Uh, and on um, uh, Rachel Hamilton's final point, I have spent a lot of time in meetings with members across uh, this uh, chamber, including herself and others from the Conservative uh, group, uh, including members Pam Duncan Glancy and members Sarah Boyack, indeed as well, and others uh, from the Labour uh, group, uh, and uh, indeed with, uh, with people. Yes. Can I just remind the member opposite that Jackson Carlow supported this? I mean, that's cross party that, you know, we considered this and came together about it. So I think it's unfair to say there hasn't been cross party consideration, certainly in my mind. I remind the member that we had a, a free vote within our party. So, uh, 
Well, I, I think to, <laughs> to, 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 conclude, to conclude, I think uh, Christine Gray makes an important point that there has been cross-party support for various aspects of, of various amendments, um, and I think that's a good thing. And just finally, you know, I have said uh, previously, and, I, and I've said already today, and I'll say again that you know my door remains open uh, for further discussions uh, in advance of stage three. Um, I feel that, and I hope others feel that I've uh, had constructive discussions and where I have been able uh, to support and work with people around amendments. Yes, I will. Yes. Thanks for taking intervention. Um, you said that there were words that you uh, felt were legally challengeable um, and you particularly specified appropriate support. What would be legally challengeable there? Because I've kept it as a... Um, a phrase that is a, a word that is not heavily detailed to give you that flexibility in terms of defining what would be appropriate. It would be the ministers to judge what would be appropriate. And I think that's where um, I would say to Sarah Boyack, uh, um, as I've, I think I've said to um, Pam Duncan Glancy when we've had this discussion, it really wouldn't, um, it's about what does that mean? Does it mean that Scottish ministers would decide which organisations people should be? Uh, signposted to, I could see that would get us into a great deal of difficulty um, and therefore I would be uh, very uh, resistant to that. If it's about the process, then I absolutely agree with Sarah Boya. The process needs to be made very, very clear. But if it's about the type of support that people should receive, then I really don't think it would be helpful for Scottish ministers to start identifying organisations that uh, that would either not be or, or would be uh, deemed a, a, for appropriate uh, to provide support. So those are where my concerns lie, which is why uh, I point again to Christine Graham's amendments, which focus on the process of applying the effect, the statutory declaration requirement, and the consequences of a false application. Uh, having said that, you know I would be happy to continue to have discussions with uh, Sarah Boyack in advance uh, of stage uh, three. But I would ask uh, for today's purposes that uh, Sarah Boyack's uh, amendments are not uh, supported, and that Christine Graham's amendment is. Okay, thank you. I go to Sarah Boyack to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 128. Okay, thanks very much. And it's good to hear people's views on this. Um, I think that I, I don't have any uh, objection to Christine Graham's amendment. I think it is really good because it will give a formal process about the process of applying for a gender recognition certificate. But I think there are wider issues. Um, before somebody potentially even gets to that stage where they need information and they need support. So it's having the wider range of support that I think is critical. And that's why I was keen uh, for Scottish ministers to be able to decide what those steps were. For example, there's interdepartmental work uh, across different government departments, whether it's education and health, whether there's wider support that is needed. Um, and it is also thinking about... Um, the range of support that is available, because Scottish Government will no doubt be funding uh, support going forward, not just within the government's work, but with uh, third sector organisations, charities, the Scottish Government does that already. So I was actually trying to be helpful to say this does not happen at the moment. I will, yes. I, I don't know, um, forgive me if you were listening, but um, Amendment 39, which has been agreed by the committee, is on additional guidance, advice and support for young applicants. This is prior to them making their application. And it must be the position they confront the registrar general. The applicant has discussed the implications for the applicant of obtaining a gender recognition certificate with an individual, an individual who, A, has a role which involves guidance, advice or support to young people. So it's, it's there at the beginning. I heard that debate. But I thought you might, yes. No, I heard that debate. Here. I was sitting in my office I listening know, to sure all the debates. And I totally welcome that. But the people that were coming to me were not actually young. It's not, it's not just an... It's particularly an issue for young people, I think, 16, 17, 18. But there are older people as well who need that advice. And that's why I'm saying I think the advice you've recommended for um, the Registrar General is good, but there's other advice as well. And I think particularly the range of mental health support that's needed, counselling, but also wider advice, I think, is needed. 
Um, and it would be from a range of organisations, both voluntary and statutory. So it's meant to be a constructive amendment. Um, if the Cabinet Secretary is saying that she's prepared to um, discuss the term appropriate and that that's what's wrong with my amendment, I would be prepared not to move it today and come back potentially at stage three. But it's just to clarify that I don't see it as replicating either the amendment you're moving now, Christine, or the one you moved earlier today, both of which I think are good amendments. This is taking it further and opening it out to the wider community of people who I think need support. Can I confirm if you are pressing or withdrawing your amendment? So if the Cabinet Secretary is prepared to discuss with me the term appropriate, I am happy to um, not move or to withdraw the movement technically at this stage. Um, if, it's, if, it's, if it's a total objection, then, you know, but are you prepared to discuss uh, the term that you identified uh, in your comments? I, I am. Um, though the caveat I would, and I'm pleased to be able to, you know, have further discussions with Sarah Boyack, but I think what we want to avoid, just for the, the voice of any doubt, is listing organisations that we deem to be appropriate for support. I don't think that would be a wise thing for Scottish ministers to do. So if Sarah Boyack is happy to have discussions with that caveat in place, then I'm happy to have further discussions with her. Absolutely, because those organisations will change over the years. and It won't be a, a set list of the perfect list of people. That I, I think this legislation will lead to more organisations. It's how do people know that they exist? And, and that's what I was aiming to do here. So on that basis, I'm prepared to not to withdraw my movement earlier, but I do intend to come back on this one at stage three okay. subse uh, after subsequent conversations. Okay, the member is requesting permission to withdraw Amendment 128. Is that agreed? Yeah. Okay, that being agreed. Um, call Amendment 5 in the name of Sue Weber. Are we debated with Amendment 2? Sue Weber to move or not move? Not moved. Um, so the question is that Section 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. That is agreed to. I call Amendment 6 in the name of Sue Weber. Already debated with Amendment 2. Sue Weber to move or not move? Thank you. So the question is that Section 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? It is agreed. I call Amendments 49, 50, 51 and 52, all in the name of Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 49 to 52 on block. Uh, formally moved. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 49 to 52? No objections. So, therefore, the question is that amendments 49 to 52 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. That is agreed to. I call amendment 53 in the name of Cabinet Secretary, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Cabinet Secretary to move amendment 53 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, convener, as the name suggests, the amendments in this group are of a minor technical nature. Uh, amendments uh, 53, 64 to 65, 69 to 70, 78 and 82 have been put forward at the suggestion of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. As introduced, the bill refers in a number of places to the role of the sheriff in either giving notice that a certi certificate has been issued or in giving copies of such certificates to the Registrar General. And whilst technically competent, the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service have suggested that for the sake of clarity, these references should instead be to the Sheriff Clark, as in practice it would be the Sheriff Clark who would be carrying out this function. Amendment 79 relates to a consequential amendment to the 2004 Act, which was inadvertently omitted from the Bill at introduction. This amendment repeals a subsection of that Act, which provides that where a full GRC is issued by the Gender Recognition Panel to a person who is a party to a marriage under the law of Northern Ireland or a civil partnership under that law, the Secretary of State must send a copy of the certificate to the Registrar General for Northern Ireland. The Bill already repeals similar provision in relation to England and Wales, and this amendment does so for Northern Ireland as well. Uh, I move Amendment 53. Okay, I have no um, indications of anyone wanting to speak, so Cabinet Secretary to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 53. Uh, nothing else to uh, say, and I press the amendment. Press amendment. So the question is that Amendment 53 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. Call Amendment 54 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Uh, move formally. So the question is that Amendment 54 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. Call Amendment 55 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Move formally. 
question is that Amendment 55 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yeah. That is agreed. I call Amendment 7 in the name of Sue Webber, already debated with Amendment 2. Sue Webber to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Thank you. So the question is that Section 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 56 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 83. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Move formally. The question is that Amendment 56 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah, agreed. That is agreed. I call Amendment 32 in the name of Ros McCall, already debated with Amendment 83. Ros McCall to move or not move? Not moved. Um, I call Amendment 93 in the name of Ros McCall, already debated with Amendment 83. Ros McCall to move or not move? Not, uh, sorry, not moved. I call Amendment 57 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 83. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Move formally. The question is that Amendment 57 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. I call Amendment 58 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 83. The question is Amendment 58 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 59 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with 47. Move Cabinet formally, sorry. Cabinet Secretary to move <laughs> formally. <laughs> move formally. Okay, the question is that Amendment 59 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, I call Amendment 33 in the name of Ros McCall, already debated with Amendment 83. Ros McCall to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 34 in the name of Ros McCall, already debated with Amendment 83. Ros McCall to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 8 in the name of Sue Me Weber, already debated with Amendment 2. Sue Weber to move or not move? Moved. Sorry, was that? Moved. Moved. Okay, the question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no. That is not agreed. So, all those in favour of Amendment 8, please vote. And all those against? And abstentions? That's two for, five against. The amendment, therefore, is not carried and Section 8 is therefore agreed to. I now call Amendment 60 in the name of Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Formally moved. Question is that Amendment 60 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. I call Amendment 129 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 114. Russell Finlay to move or not move? Yeah, move. The question is that Amendment 129 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. That is not agreed, so we move to a vote. All those in favour, please vote. Yep. And all those against? Two, four, five against, no abstentions. It's therefore not agreed to. Call Amendment 61 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 61 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 62 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 62 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 94 in the name of Ros McCall, already debated with Amendment 83. Ros McCall to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 63, 64 and 65, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 63 to 65 on block. I formally moved on block. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendment 63 to 65? No. No member objects, so therefore the question is that amendments 63 to 65 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. I call amendment 95 in the name of Maggie Chapman, grouped with amendments 130, 96, 97 and 132. Maggie Chapman to move amendment 95 and speak to all amendments in the group.
Thank you very much, Joe. We heard many other witnesses express their very grave concern with the provisions in the bill as, they, as it currently stands to expand the definition of a person with an interest who could apply for a gender recognition certificate to be revoked. This increases the risk substantially that someone who disapproves of a trans person's gender rec recognition certificate application will seek to use the courts to have that certificate revoked. Such vexatious and or malicious complaints to the Sheriff Court to revoke a GRC simply because they do not accept the trans status of the GRC applicant should not be enabled. And if such applications for revocation ever do happen, they should be viewed as vexatious and or malicious and treated accordingly. One mechanism to reduce the opportunity to make vexatious or malicious applications for revocation is to clearly and narrowly define who a person of interest is. The current Gender Recognition Act 2004 defines a person with an interest quite narrowly, a spouse, the Registrar General and the Secretary of State. My Amendment 97 replicates this narrow definition, including spouse, civil partner, Registrar General and the Secretary of State. This is to limit the likelihood of unsupported family members or others who disapprove of a trans person's right to be who they are, having the mechanism to challenge a GRC. My Amendment 95 seeks to put in place a step before any revocation application gets to the sh Sheriff Court by requiring it to go through the Registrar General's office first. The Registrar General would then determine whether it was appropriate to escalate such a revocation application to the courts. However, I think Pam Duncan Glancy's Amendment 130 is better than mine, so I'll not press my 95 and will instead support hers. On the, pen, on the penalties for those who seek to revoke a GRC for vexatious or malicious reasons, my Amendment 96 is essentially a pro big amendment in an attempt to have a wider conversation before Stage 3 to tighten up this bit of the bill. I will not move 96, as again, I think Pam Duncan Glancy's Amendment 132 covers this more effectively. But I do consider that we do need further conversation to make it absolutely clear that malicious or vexatious attempts to revoke a gender recognition certificate will not be allowed and will be taken very seriously when they do happen. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Pam Duncan Glancy to speak to Amendment 130 and other amendments in the group. Convener, um, and I, I thank um, Maggie Chapman for, for her comments on, on my amendments in this group. So let me first of all say, unfortunately, um, I won't be able to support 97 because I believe narrowing the list of people could prevent someone who has a genuine interest in someone's GRC using the person of interest in good faith provisions on the grounds of genuine concerns of capacity. However, the aims of my amendment, as have already been alluded in 130 and 132, attempt to add safeguards and proportionality to the process that would prevent people using it maliciously. And for that reason, I'd ask people to support my amendments. And had you pushed your, your 95 and 90, or had the member pushed 95 and 96, I think um, they were reasonable. But I'd ask members to support mine. Thank you. Thank you. And any other members? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. Um, I know from the evidence provided to the committee and through our own consultations that there is a concern in the trans community where they see potential for the misuse of the provision in the bill for a person with an interest to apply to a sheriff for a GRC to be revoked. And I can understand that. Uh, we have set out in our stage one response why this provision is in the bill. And I'll do so again uh, very briefly now. The bill allows for a person who has an interest in a GRC to apply to the sheriff to revoke a certificate on the ground that the application was fraudulent or that the applicant was incapable of understanding the effect of it or that the applicant was incapable of validly making the application. The person seeking to revoke a certificate would need to have a genuine interest in the certificate. It would have to affect them personally or professionally and they would be required to produce evidence of the ground on which the certificate could be revoked. It is a common statutory requirement that a person have an interest in a particular matter in order to bring proceedings to court, and the courts are used to uh, determining what amounts to a genuine interest. Amendments 95 and 130 would give the Registrar-General a preliminary ro role in assessing potential applications to a sheriff and refusing 
permission to apply to the sheriff based on whether the application is malicious and or the applicant has a genuine interest. But we can see no precedent for this type of process, and this would considerably expand the role and remit of the Registrar General in a way that cannot be supported. It is for a sheriff who has appropriate expertise to make judgments on whether a person has a genuine interest and whether their claim is valid. I do understand why Maggie Chapman and Pam Duncan Glancy have lodged uh, these amendments, but I do not view this as a reasonable role for the Registrar General to fulfil, and I therefore urge the committee not to support them. Amendment 97 would restrict those who can apply for the revocation to the Registrar General, a spouse or civil partner or the Secretary of State. Uh, this is presumably intended to echo the current provision in the 2004 Act, though it is not clear why the UK Secretary of State should be included here in relation to GRCs issued under the Scottish system. The grounds on which an application for revocation of a GRC can be made under the 2004 Act refer only to fraudulent applications. The proposals in the Bill means the grounds on which an application can be made also include incapacity or where the Registrar General has issued the wrong type of certificate. In relation to the Committee's recommendation to define who may be persons who have an interest, we consider that seeking to list such persons in the Bill could lead to an, uh, an appropriate category of person potentially being omitted. Under my Amendment 60, the Registrar General will be able to apply to a Sheriff before issuing a GRC, for it is not the role of the Registrar General or his staff to assess the capacity of applicants. The courts will be able to make that determination considering all the evidence. It is important to stress that provision around the capacity of applicants to understand the effect of a GRC is there to protect those applicants and removing those grounds could have negative impacts for some applicants. Amendments 96 and 132 introduce either a criminal offence or a power for a sheriff to award damages on the basis of a malicious application. I consider this to be disproportionate. I have serious concerns about criminalising applications to a sheriff in any circumstances on access to justice grounds. I'm not aware of a precedent for such an offence and there would be human rights implications to consider. It's important to remember that the courts deal with many applications in many areas, including where issues have arisen among family members. I don't necessarily consider that where issues arise in the family in these circumstances, that criminalisation would necessarily be a ben ben beneficial outcome for any party. On the power to award damages, this requires further consideration, as how malicious is to be interpreted is not quite clear, since it's not a commonly used term in this context. If a person were to make repeated vexatious applications to revoke a GRC or GRCs, there is an existing scheme in the Courts Reform Scotland Act 2014 that would allow the Lord Advocate in the public interest to apply to the Court of Session for a vexatious litigation order. This would require the person to get permission from the Court of Session before making a further application. I know this is not exactly what is proposed in Pam Duncan Glancy's amendment, but it does provide a safeguard against people abusing the system. For these reasons, I, I can't support any of the specific changes made by amendments in, uh, in this group. To reiterate, applicants for revocation would need to demonstrate that they have a genuine interest and the Sheriff would need to be satisfied of this. They would also then need to provide evidence to prove the grounds of their application. And while I'm sympathetic to the aims of these amendments, uh, but uh, I don't currently see what additional provision could be made in this bill to address those concerns without raising wider human rights and access to justice issues. Um, obviously, if there's something that can be added, I'd be happy to work with both members ahead of stage three. But I would ask that these, member, these amendments are not supported at this time. Thank you. Um, Maggie Chapman to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 95. I, I have nothing further to add and I will withdraw 95 if the committee agrees. Members requested to withdraw Amendment 95. Is that agreeable? Yes. Okay. I therefore call Amendment 130 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with Amendment 95. Pam Duncan Glancy to move or not move. So the question is, Amendment 130 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. That is not agreed, so we'll go to the vote. All members who wish to vote uh, yes, please raise your hand.
So it's, it's Amendment 130. So all those who wish to vote for Amendment 130, please raise your hands. Okay, all those against? Okay. So there is two for and five against. The amendment is not agreed. Call Amendment 131 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 114. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 131 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No, That is not agreed, so therefore move to the vote. All those who want to vote yes, please raise your hand. And all those against? And abstentions? So there is three for and four against, so the amendment is not agreed to. Call amendment, si amendment 66, 67, 68, 69 and 70, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendment 66 to 70 on block. Uh, formally moved on block. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendment 66 to 70? No. Therefore, the question is that amendments 66 to 70 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. I call Amendment 96 in the name of Maggie Chapman, already debated with Amendment 95. Maggie Chapman to move or not move? Not moved. The question, I, I therefore call Amendment 97 in the name of Maggie Chapman, already debated with Amendment 95. Maggie Chapman to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 97 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is not agreed. Um, all those in favour of Amendment 97, please vote now. All those against? And that is one vote for and six votes against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call Amendment 132 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with Amendment 95. Pam Duncan Glancy to move or not move? Um, moved, please. The question is that Amendment 132 in the, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is not agreed to. So again, we move to the vote. All those in favour, please vote. And all those against. That's two for and five against. So the amendment is not agreed to. Call Amendment 9 in the name of Sue Weber. Already debated with Amendment 2. Sue Weber to move or not move? So the question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. So, the, so we'll go to a vote. All those in favour, please vote. And all those against. It's two for and five against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to and Section 9 is therefore agreed. Um, I call Amendment 10 in the name of Sue, Sue Weber, already debated with Amendment 2. Sue Weber to move or not move? Uh, moved. So the question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no. We are not agreed, so we move to the vote. All those in favour of Amendment 10, please vote now. And all those against? So that is two for and five against. So that is not agreed to and section 10 is therefore agreed. Call Amendment 98 in the name of Ros McCall. Already debated with Amendment 83. Ros McCall to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 11 in the name of Sue Weber. Already, already debated with Amendment 2. Sue Weber to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. Therefore, we go to the vote. All those in favour of Amendment 11, please vote. And all those against. So two for and five against. Amendment is therefore not agreed to and Section 11 is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 71 in the name of Christine Graham, already, already debated with Amendment 128. Christine Graham to move or not move? Moved, convener. The question is, Amendment 71 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. There is not agreed, so we'll move to the vote. 
All those in favour of Amendment 71, please vote now. All those against? Okay, that's 4-4 four, four and 3 against. The amendment is therefore agreed to. Call Amendment 12 in the name of Sue... Oh, sorry. Um, can I withdraw my yeah, voting intention? It. That was meant to be a yes. yes. Sorry about that. On 71, Christine Graham's amendment. Is that possible to do? If, if you can't do that, I can put it on official record that I okay. supported it. Okay, we haven't gone past the vote, so let's do the vote on 71. Let's do the vote on 71. And 71 again. Okay, okay no, no problem. Let's do the vote again. So the vote, the question is, on Amendment 71, all those in favour of Amendment 71, please vote now. We're all losing the plot. Sorry. Okay. All those, all those, all those against? Okay, Amendment 71 is agreed unanimously. Thank you. <laughs> Call Amendment 12 in the name of Sue Webber. Already debated with Amendment 2. Sue Webber to move or not move. Okay, so the question is, Amendment 12 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, we are not agreed, so we'll go to the vote. All those who wish to vote for the amendment, please raise your hands. And all those against? That's two for and five against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to and section 12 is agreed. I call amendment 13 in the name of Sue Weber. Moved. Um, moved. Moved. Okay, the question is that amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. That is not agreed. We'll move to the vote. All those in favour of amendment 13, please vote now. And all those against? Two, that's two four and five against. So that is therefore not agreed and section 13 is agreed to. So we've made good progress and that now seems like a good place for us all to break today. So that completes our first day of stage two consideration for this bill. We'll continue our consideration at our meeting next week. Um, I want to thank the Cabinet Secretary and her officials for their attendance, and that concludes our meeting for today. <laughs>